good afternoon, all of you. So it's indeed a great pleasure to again uh, come to this uh, meeting. And uh, this is the third session of the World Webinar of Ophthalmology. Yesterday evening, we had the cataract session, which was attended by more than about 2,000 people. Today morning, we had the glaucoma session. And now we have the uveitis and inflammation session. So this is a World Webinar of Ophthalmology Revision in seven modules intended to capture 360 degree ophthalmology revision over the 24 hour period. So uh, just sharing uh, this presentation. So this is in nutshell, the UVITIS program for you uh, with uh, chairman, Dr. Jyotir May Bishwas and uh, uh, moderators, Dr. Risha Kayar and uh, Dr. Natasha Radhakrishnan. Regarding JP sir, uh, everybody in the country and abroad knows him. He is currently the director of UVITIS and ophthalmic pathology departments at Shankar Netral at Chennai. He has published widely about 500 articles in peer reviewed journals, 65 chapters in the books of ophthalmology. He presented 32 papers in international conferences and 170 papers in the national and state conferences. He is a reviewer of 55 journals. He has received 43 awards. He is a member of the International UVIT Study Group. American UVIT Society and Executive Council member for the International Ocular Inflammation Society. We welcome you, Jodhir Bhaimishwar, sir. Uh, uh, as the chairman of this program, I'm sure that this program will be superb. He will be assisted and moderated by Dr. Uh, Risha Kaya, who is consultant medical retina and UVA, Little Flower Hospital, Ankamani, who did her DNB and fellowship in medical retina from Little Flower and also training from Shankar Nitralia, Chennai and by Dr. Natasha Radhakrishnan, my own colleague at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. She's professor and retina specialist at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. She's trained in managing all aspects of adult retinal diseases, including diabetic retinopathy and AMD. Pediatric retinal diseases are the special interest and uh, uveitis. Then she's also uh, significantly working on retinopathy of prematurity, eye involvement in systemic and genetic diseases, neurological diseases, and other eye disorders inflammatory diseases, including uveitis and systemic vasculitis. She has several national and international publications to her credit and had presented papers in various state and national forms. So uh, with this short introduction, I would like to give the stage to Dr. Judith Mai Bishwa, sir, and uh, uh, Risha and Natasha. And there is one request, we should all stick to time because uh, we have a type program here. And immediately after this, we have the pediatric ophthalmology program. So please, everybody, I think Dr. Akash will help us uh, inform us about the time. Thank you very much. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Thank you, including UVITs and intraocular inflammation, inflammation in the world ophthalmology revision. So it's a really is an important disease that we concern. And a lot of visual morbidity occurs due to the UVITs. And we have got galaxy of uh, experts uh, of UVITs over here and that would be we would like to request all of us to stick to time so that we can have a little discussion at the end and Dr. Risha and Dr. Natasha will coordinate. We'll start the program with uh, Dr. Risha who will be talking on uh, history taking and clinical examination of UVIT. Thank you sir. Risha please. Thank you, sir. Uh, the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Gobal and Dr. Vishwas for giving me this uh, opportunity. I'll be dealing with uh, history taking and clinical examination of uveitis patient. Why a special mention is required regarding history and clinical examination in a uveitis session? Because uveitis workup always start with an elaborate history taking. Subsequently, meticulous systemic and ocular examination will offer the clinical conclusion. It is estimated that 70% of diagnosis can be made on the basis of a detailed medical history and clinical workup. Should be further confirmed or ruled out by a tailored laboratory approach. A complete history is very crucial. It should include onset and progression of symptoms course and treatment received, previous corticosteroid therapy, and regarding previous attacks and previous response to treatment, 
a detailed systemic history is a must. And apart from that, social history, dietary history, sexual and drug histories also should be obtained in detail. I am going to give you some examples of each. This was a 26-year-old lady presented with a, uh, defective vision of two weeks duration. He, she had a choroiditis patch. While taking history, she gave a history of pulmonary TB for her mother and sister. So the diagnosis is very easy now, TB choroiditis. Yet another patient, uh, CA breast mastectomy done five years before, she presented with uh, sudden onset anterior uveitis of one day duration. She also gave history of solidronic acid injection taken one day prior. So that was a case of drug-induced uveitis. Sometimes eliciting history may not be as simple as we think. For example, this 23-year-old uh, engineering student who was very healthy, presented with a posterior uveitis-like picture. While eliciting history again and again, he gave a history of IV drug abuse. So that was a case of endogenous end of due to fungal infection. Again, another 25-year-old male presented with an anterior, mild anterior uveitis in both eyes. He gave a history of uh, tubular interstitial nephritis before, and this was the recurrence. And it was a case of TINU. He also had a high beta-2 microglobulin levels. Sometimes history may mislead also. So we should think twice. Uh, as in this case, this was a case of a vaginous granulomatosis lady on immunosuppression presented with a unilateral and posterior uveitis. On careful examination, this was having an ARN-like picture and that was a case of CMV retinitis. A thorough head to toe assessment is a must for a uveitis practitioner while assessing a uveitis case. We'll start from the vitals. This was a young male, was referred as a case of posterior uveitis, but his BP was too high, around 220, 110, and that was uh, turned to be a, a hypertensive choroidopathy. While entering our OPD, the posture of the patient itself will give you clues regarding the diagnosis. For example, a severe non-granulomatous anterior uveitis with hypopion recurrent attacks and patient had a stiff neck. So the diagnosis is HLA-B27 associated uveitis. Another uh, child presented with chronic uveitis with BSK changes, he had swollen joints. So that was a case of JIA uveitis. Another young male presented with a hypopion uveitis and a bilateral vitritis with vasculitis. He had after sulcers in oral cavity, so that was best set. Yet another lady presented with a bilateral exudative retinal detachment with a vitiligo and poliosis, so that was VKH syndrome. In this young lady, uh, she had occlusive vasculitis-like picture and the face rash gives the clue regarding SLE. Uh, another uh, patient with granulomatous uveitis with candle wax dripping and snowballs. He had these skin lesions uh, over his uh, upper limb. So that was a case of sarcoidosis. A meticulous slit lamp examination and a thorough indirect ophthalmoscopy is a must on each and every visit of the patient. And that can give you uh, clues regarding the diagnosis. As in the first picture, that's a case of cystic cyst in the anterior uh, chamber. And the second picture shows lepra nodules. So it's a case of leprosy associated uveitis. And the third one is uh, sectoral iris atrophy of viral uveitis. Look carefully onto the KPs that can again cut short the uh, diagnosis. Like in the first picture, it's a case of typical case of granulomatous uveitis. So you should first think about 
granulomatous conditions like TB and sarcoidosis. And the second picture shows pigmented KPs. So we should rule out viral etiology first. And the third is the typical picture of a non-granulomatous anterior uveitis. Always masquerades we should keep in mind because this 55-year-old smoker was referred as a case of granulomatous uveitis, but on careful examination, you can see the deposits on the iris. So that was a case of adenocarcinoma lamb with uh, meds. Think about non-uveitic conditions also. Like in this case, she ha patient had chronic inflammation but started only after cataract surgery. On careful examination, you can see the deposits on the posterior capsule. So that was a case of P acne and of thalmitis. Check the other eye also. Again, in a case of sympathetic ophthalmia, you can see other eye history of uh, trauma and uh, changes suggestive of uh, trauma in the other eye. Always and always do an indirect ophthalmoscopy so that you won't miss an active lesion in the periphery like in this case. And uh, try, to, uh, not, try not to miss an active inflammation. As in first case, it's very easy. You uh, can see a reactivation of a toxo scar. The, the reactivation patch is very well seen. But in the second case, you can easily miss the subtle changes of reactivation close to the scar. Try to identify the patterns as in a CMV retinitis, the Kisapai appearance and the typical spread of ARN and the wavy margins of serpiginous choroiditis, chyliriasis, arteriolitis in a case of uh, toxo and ground glass appearance of uh, syphilitic uh, posterior uveitis, uh, sunset glow fundus and Dallin fuchs nodules of uh, sympathetic ophthalmia. And don't forget to identify complications like CME in chronic uveitis, secondary CNVM of a macular scar, NVE or NVD, and secondary cataracts in uh, chronic uveitis cases. Well, you have started your therapy. Don't look only into the eye for the improvement. You should look the patient as a whole to monitor the side effects like pushing out faces in uh, chronic steroid treatment cases and gum hyperplasia in cyclosporin treated patients of course in the eye secondary glaucoma due to steroids and the key issue here is the eye doesn't see what the mind doesn't know so you should be keep updated otherwise you don't know what all things to look for thank you thank you risha is that very nice uh, pictures and showing you the showing that the whole gamut of uh, uveitis uh, with the various systemic uh, association is very important that uh, you should not see that patient in the sleep lamp first. Have a look at the patient. That can give it a lot of clue. Like you can see that the malar rash or alopecia, vitiligo, all these things you can miss. And also you should see that the whole record which the patient is bringing with him. So, don't be in a rush in uveitis. So see each of the patient's records, you will find out that the patient has high blood sugar or patient has nephrotic syndromes and the urea creatinine is elevated or high blood pressure. All these things will not only help you to treat the patient, also give a clue to the diagnosis. So we'll go to that next talk by Dr. Partho, talking Dr. Majinda from Shankanetra Alai. You will be talking about anterior uveitis. Don't think so simple. This is the uh, title which I have given. Dr. Risha or Natasha can introduce the part. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. the next speaker, Dr. Partho Pratim Datta Majumdar. He's a senior consultant, Department of UVI and Intraocular Inflammation at Shankar Netralaya. He's published many articles in various journals, written 65 chapters in ophthalmology books books and he is the founder come chief editor of the popular ophthalmology portal eofta.com so uh, welcome dr partho and we are looking forward to hearing your anti uveitis don't take it so simple thanks thanks natasha but i hope my uh, slides are visible and you can hear me yes 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 yeah yeah so uh, at the 
outset, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Gopal Pillai, Dr. Natasha, Dr. Risha for uh, including me in this uh, symposium. So I'll be talking on anterior uveitis. Don't think it is so simple. Now, when I, I'll just try to define what do we mean by simple uveitis. Simple uveitis, uh, in my opinion, it's like patient comes with a set of symptoms. We identify, examine the patient, identify a few signs. And uh, many of us, we feel that what is the need of doing imaging when it is anterior uveitis. And then we order some laboratory test. And it's just like a Bollywood movie, happy ending. We start the treatment and there is complete resolution. And uh, when we define it as a simple, then we mean that, okay, there, there won't be any recurrences. But in real life scenario, if we see this, uh, this picture, there is no clear cut algorithm in reaching or diagnosing or managing a case of simple uveitis. Each of these uh, steps, which I have mentioned in the uh, right side of the slide, can pose significant diagnostic challenge. The symptoms, signs, imaging, laboratory test, and treatment. We'll just go one by one. And should not exist a comfort zone in managing a case of anterior uveitis. My uh, advice will be never think that any kind of any UV anterior uveitis case is simple or it's very easy to treat. Each case is different and each case will pose some kind of challenge. So to start with uh, the symptoms, the symptoms, mainly the two conditions I would, uh, I, I want to highlight. One is the granulomatous uveitis. Because of the insidious onset where patient is not aware so they, they won't realize that there, some inflammation is going on. Sometimes it is chronic. Uh, in the, uh, it goes for uh, months and uh, almost always diagnosed late. So that's why the granulomatous uveitis, it's very difficult and often presents very late. Now, next group is children, especially the pre valve children. So often these patients, uh, they present with juvenile idiopathic arthritis or masquerade and notoriously often they, they present without any congestion. So the whiter uveitis does not arise any suspicion and parents also uh, don't bring them for eye checkup. So that in this scenario, don't go with the symptoms. The symptoms can be misleading. Now, another important is the sign. So now when we come, uh, come to the... Uh, Describing the clinical sign, let me give the example of HLA B27 uveitis. We all know that the prevent B dominant site of inflammation in anterior uveitis is anterior chamber. And in, remember, in some cases, HLA B27 associated uveitis can have anterior and intermediate uveitis. So recently, we actually analyzed uh, 431 eyes of 255 patients of Shankar in presenting in Shankar Netralaya, and we realized that. 3.9, almost 4% of this patient presented with anterior and intermediate uveitis. So that means the patient had inflammation in the AC and vitreous. So is it spillover uveitis? No, it is not spillover uveitis. If you read the sun classification carefully, it is said that if there is an inflammation where there is more AC reaction than that is observed in a case of intermediate uveitis and if there is more vitreitis than in a case of iridocyclitis, then you should use the term anterior and intermediate uveitis. So next time you see, don't confuse them with panuveitis. Even in literature also, there are many cases where this kind of cases has been labeled as a panuveitis. But ideally, these are the cases where you should mention the term anterior and intermediate uveitis. Now, there is an Arabic uh, proverb with, uh, which says that when fate arrives, the physician becomes a fool. So don't jump into a diagnosis from a single sign. Don't think that if the patient is having mutton fat capis, then it is TB or sarcoid. The viral UV anterior UV8 is also can present with mutton fat capis. Similarly, the diffuse distribution can be seen in fugues and viral Hypertensive UV8 is not only the feature of the viral UV8, it can be seen in toxoplasma also. So my uh, uh, su suggestion will be don't jump or don't try to arrive at a diagnosis from a single sign. Your duty is to, as a UVS specialist, you have to solve the jigsaw puzzle, which comprises of clinical signs. You have to take a metic meticulous history, like the Dr. Risha uh, said. Then you have to check the laterality of the eye and the systemic signs. For example, HLA B27 patient, it will always have 
the recurrent attack, but it will keep alternating between the eyes. The viral uveitis, it will be always almost confined to a single eye. The fuchs uveitis, though it is confined to the single, uh, single eye, the iris pattern will be different. So you have to correlate everything together and arrive at a diagnosis. Now, uh, coming to the imaging, I want to show you a six-year-old child uh, case history. We always, we know that JIA or juvenile idiopathic arthritis almost always present as an anterior uveitis and they, hardly there is any posterior segment manifestation. This child presented to us and we saw some yellowish lesion in the fundus and we did an imaging and we found what? It was a case of inflammatory CNVM. So sometimes anterior uveitis can present with posterior segment complication and you have to check for it. So imaging, are, imaging can help you to achieve or clinch this diagnosis. This patient actually, the vision recovered to six by six with the intravitreal injection of ranibizumab. The same, similarly, a 22 year old male presented with severe diminution of vision referred the, uh, to UVA, UVA clinic when he incidentally actually came for a eye checkup and it was detected. So the, he denied any history of redness, any ocular pain in the past. And when we did an ultrasound, it was, it was showing a case of old regmatogenous retinal detachment. So old regmatogenous RD sometimes actually can give a picture of inflammation. So posterior segment imaging is very important. If you can't see the fundus, go for ultrasound, uh, B-scan ultrasound, so that you can pick up if there is any pathology associated with it. Coming to the laboratory investigation, this was a, my friend, uh, uh, ophthalmologist, hard, he did not imagine when he examined this five-year-old child who presented uh, with an anterior granulomatous like picture and he was not, the child was not responding to steroid and cycloplegic and when we finally, we did the AC tap, we found that it was a case of diffuse anterior infiltrating retinoblastoma. Coming to the treatment, my last point, the, you have to remember that the prednisolone acetate has a better penetration than the dexamethasin and don't use cyclopentolate while treating a case of anterior uveitis because it is chemo attractant. So it attracts the inflammatory cells and can actually cause more damage than any useful effect. The end point of treatment should be always complete remission. Don't leave a patient with chronic smoldering inflammation. These are the patient with anterior uveitis. Chronic smoldering inf inflammation can develop later chronic CNVM or some other complications. So now if, uh, what to do when an anterior uveitis is not responding to topical treatment, always revisit your diagnosis. Make sure that your anterior uveitis is not part of a systemic disease like Bessets or something else. Check patient's compliance. Many of the time, actually, prednisolone acetate or the suspension, the patients are not shaking well. So you have, in, in a study, it has been seen that one should ideally shake the bottle 20 times to reach the desired level of concentration in a, in a case of suspension eye drop. So make sure that the patient is using, uh, using the instruction properly. And if it is not responding, sometimes you may have to give some local steroid, periocular steroid. And in cases with severe anterior uveitis, hypotony, you may have to use systemic steroid. Just to conclude my talk, search for the primary site of the inflammation. All, do not ignore but never bowled over by the symptoms and signs. Beware of vision threatening complication in anterior uveitis. In, in difficult scenario, imaging can help you. Tissue diagnosis helps in the diagnosis in difficult scenario. So if you are not sure, try to get a tissue diagnosis. It can be a simple anterior chamber tap. Complete remission should be the mission of treating any case of uveitis, not only anterior uveitis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Partho, for giving that whole gamut of anterior uveitis. This is the term, uh, title I gave it is anterior uveitis. Don't think so simple. I believe that because it can have the underlying uh, very uh, serious systemic disease like basic sarcoid, where is the multi-organ involvement can be there and you need multi-specialty treatment. So uveitis is a is not only a single, uh, like an ocular involvement, it can have a systemic involvement also. Even um, there can be muscular, some tumors, particularly in the young children and uh, where there is a exudative mass is seen in the anterior chamber, it could be diffused into uh, retinoblastoma. So 
don't think that anti uveitis means you uh, do an HLA B27 or treat with the topical steroids and mediatic cyclopridic agent. That is not the end of the story. We have to look carefully that systemic association, whether it's uh, or, or any kind of a muscular syndrome, also to look beyond the slit lamp uh, behind the lens, whether there is any cells in the vitreous, whether you are missing an intermediate deviatis, or whether there is an anterior and intermediate deviatis together. So with this, uh, we'll go to the next, uh, next talk, Risha. Our next speaker is Dr. Sharanya Sara Abraham. She did her graduation from Father Muller and uh, post-graduation from Aravind Eye Hospital and Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. She did her fellowship in UVI and medical retina from Shankar Netralaya and the observership from Moorfields Eye Hospital, London. Currently, she is the consultant in UVI department at Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. Over to you, Sharanya, for her talk on intermediate uveitis and any. you can share yours. Thank you, Richard. Uh, can you see my slides, Richard? Not yet. No, just do screen share. It's visible? Not yet. Uh, just at the uh, lower part, uh, yes. one screen yes. share option is there. Yes, Sharon, it's done. Yes, perfect. You can make it full screen. Thank you very much, Risha. And uh, thank you very much to all the organizers for including me in this talk today. Today, we will discuss intermediate uveitis. It is an inflammation that predominantly involves the anterior vitreous, the peripheral retina, and the pars plana of the ciliary body. Pars planitis is a type of intermediate uveitis with snowball exudates in the vitreous, snowbank formation in the peripheral retina, and ideally has no association of systemic disease. There has been a difference in nomenclature through the years, the earliest being cyclitis. The present terminology that we use is intermediate uveitis, which was coined by the IUSG in 1987. The first detailed documentation of the past planar was by Professor Charles Capens. Epidemiologically wise, it is most commonly a bilateral condition and uh, about 20% of the patients we see in the uveitis clinic at Shankaranetralia have intermediate uveitis. Early studies have shown that the incidence is about 2 per 1 lakh or 100,000 population. The site of inflammation is predominantly the ciliary body, vitreous and the peripheral retina. The exact cause of this disease is unknown. It could be cell-mediated immunity, a preponderance of T helper cells, and also an increased sensitivity to retinal S antigen. It has been described that there could be a circulating protein associated with active pars planitis. The clinical features, symptoms-wise, most commonly floaters, a painless blurring of vision may be associated. When the vision loss is dramatic, it could be from vitreous hemorrhage, cystoid macular edema or disc edema, and when pain is associated, usually a secondary glaucoma. Signs are very few in the anterior segment. It's usually a quiet eye. There may be band-shaped keratopathy. Mutton fat KPs, as described earlier, could be seen in sarcoidosis and tuberculosis. There may be peripheral anterior synecae or posterior synecae and secondary glaucoma. The posterior segment findings are more profound with vitreous cells, vitreous strands, snowball opacities or snow banking, retinal vasculitis or peripheral retinal neovascularization. Cystoid macular edema, epiretinal membranes, disc edema and retinal detachment can also be seen. These are two examples of vitreous strands and vitreous cells. They must be looked for on slit lamp examination in the retrolental space. In children, the disease is usually carries a very poor prognosis and can just be seen as band-shaped keratopathy. These are some fundus examination techniques which show what a normal pars plana would look like. Indentation is mandated. Focal exudates may be seen and in the third picture on the bottom, snow banking. Snow banking is a focal globular yellowish exudates that coalesce to form massive plaques over the pars plana region. They may circumscribe the whole of the pars plana and the peripheral retina and can sometimes produce traction. 
When they cicatrize, they form a limited membrane which may be grey or translucent, and later on, this may be associated with atrophy of the pars plana or the choroid. New vascularization results from ischemia of the peripheral retina, the anterior hyaloid phase, and over the pars plana. Pars planitis usually follows one of the three described courses, either self-limited, smoldering, or recurrent. There is usually an associated systemic disease in intermediate uveitis, and as Dr. Risha pointed out, history taking is mandatory. It could be sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, multiple sclerosis, as is seen in the MRI picture with demyelinating plaques, syphilis, or Lyme disease. A differential diagnosis that we must think about would include masquerade syndrome, toxocariasis, Eels disease, and amyloidosis. The laboratory workup should include a complete blood count chest X-ray or an HRCT of the chest, a Mantua or Pontiferon TB gold test, serum ACE, RPR, and TPHA. Other investigations include FFA, OCT, and a UBM. FFA in intermediate uveitis, the main finding is the petaloid pooling in the posterior pole, the macula, and what is described is cystoid macular edema. Ultra-wide field angiography has also been described mainly for peripheral vascular leakage. This is when the patient is on treatment and you want to know if your treatment is adequate or if your treatment should be stepped up. This is helpful also to look at neovascularization. UBM in intermediate uveitis is indicated when the pupil is small due to posterior sinicae, when the media is very hazy as these are often associated with complicated cataracts and in cases of hypotony. UBMs have been studied extensively and complications like ciliary body detachments and peripheral retinal tractions have been described. An OCT in pars is usually a standard SDOCT, which shows CME. Also described are wide field OCTAs, OCT angiography, and it shows that the capillary non-perfusion is more in the choroid, choriocapillaris, and in the deep choroidal plexus. In terms of treatment of intermediate uveitis and pars together, the main guidelines are that intraocular inflammation should be managed, cystoid macular edema, cataract when indicated, and any sort of a vitreous opacity, either in the form of hemorrhage or in vitreous fibrils and retinal detachment. The four-step approach that we use includes posterior subtenin injection of steroid, oral steroid, immunosuppressive agents, and indirect laser or vitrectomy. The posterior subtenin injection that we give is in the posterior subtenin space. It is repeated every three to four weeks. It is triamcinolone acetonide. Usually two to three injections are warranted. This is the Smith and Nozick technique that we follow in the outpatient department, where it is injected with the bevel facing up in the supratemporal quadrant of the eye with the patient looking down and towards the nose. So when posterior subtenance injections are compared with intravitreal, it is found that they're quite effective in bilateral CME with intermediate uveitis, although glaucoma is more with IVTA. Oral steroids may be reserved for severe bilateral cases which have failed periocular injections. Indicated dose is one milligram per kg a day and a low dose may be continued if the disease is protracted. Immunosuppressive agents, when the cases are refractory, commonly used are azathioprine, cyclosporin, and mycophenolate. Mycophenolate's efficacy and safety have been studied. Cryotherapy is when the patient does not respond even to oral steroids. There is neovascularization of the vitreous base. The technique used is a double freeze thaw technique. Dexamethasone is one of the commonly used intravitreal implants for CME. The implant is placed in the vitreous of the eye with a single-use applicator in a sutureless office-based procedure. An Ozudex implant in the vitreous looks like this. It degrades over a few months. Vitreoretinal surgery may be performed in the form of a pars planar vitrectomy in intractable vitreous inflammation where there are opacities and membranes, where there is an unresolved vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, which is usually tractional. It is believed that doing a vitrectomy might actually reduce the inflammatory cytokines in the vitreous. This has been studied in various papers. Cataract extraction is indicated at about three to six months of absolute quiescence. 
Preoperative topical systemic and periocular steroids may be used, preferably a foldable intraocular lens, and there might be the need to combine the procedure with a pass planar vitrectomy. These are some photographs of a preoperative complicated cataract operated with a in the bag pseudophagia. The effects of cataract surgery and their visual prognosis have been studied with good outcomes. An enigma is a term for any situation that is difficult to understand. Pars planitis has been described in 1987 and then revisited in 2006 because of this. To make things more confusing, the most recent article in 2021 about intermediate uveitis also describes a type of intermediate uveitis of the non pars planar type. This should mean that there are no snowballs, there's no snow banking, and there should not be any form of systemic involvement, either sarcoidosis, Lyme, syphilis, or um, TB. The patient should only have a vitreous involvement. This is not really for any uh, clinical purpose, but for research. In conclusion, the diagnosis of intermediate uveitis continues to be a challenge. It is not an uncommon condition, but picking it up is of utmost importance. It requires a meticulous examination of the past planar as early diagnosis and proper management have good visual outcomes. Thank you very much. So thank you, Sharana. Very nice overview of uh, intermediate uveitis. I just uh, wanted to tell you that if I see a dull foveal reflex or any suspicion, now known in, instead of doing an FFA, you can do an OCT, which is very helpful, and it can easily be done. Another important thing is that is the pasmodic is a very chronic disease. One should remember that and do not give the impression to the patient that it would be is healed, means it cured completely. It can come back again and is persist for very chronic course. Sometimes instead of giving steroid at the recalcitrant one, I go for uh, immunosuppressive agents at the very early stage instead of giving the patient oral steroid because they require a very long-term therapy. So keeping them on immunosuppressive agents is quite helpful, like methotrexate or mitochondrial movetate, because it's a chronic protracted course of the disease is often seen. And one of the other diseases which is shown in mace in intermediate uveitis, if you see an elderly, think about a, like over 50, if you see intermediate uveitis, think of uh, that whether you are missing lymphoma, vitreoretinal lymphoma, which can mimic an intermediate uveitis. These are the few points which come to my mind. Now we'll go to the pan uveitis. A vision threatening disease. It's a Pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Vinita Girish Rao. She completed her post-graduation in ophthalmology from Shankar Netralaya and is a senior consultant in the Department of Uveitis at Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. She has published papers in peer-reviewed journals and papers and instruction courses, presented papers and instruction courses at the AIOS conferences and state and other regional meetings and has also presented papers on uveitis at the international meeting on BKH in Rome, the IOIS and the WOC. So welcome Dr. Vinita Girish Rao for the next talk and she will be speaking on pan uveitis, a vision threatening condition. Thank you Dr. Natasha. I'll just be sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. madam. Good afternoon, everyone. My thanks to the Cochin Ophthalmic Club and uh, Dr. Gopal Pillay for inviting me to participate in this wonderful meeting. Let us look at panuveitis. Now, panuveitis is a generalized inflammation of all three parts of the uvea, that is the iris, ciliary body, and the choroid. Now, the involvement of the choroid uh, includes uh, not only choroiditis, also retinochoroiditis or even retinitis, along with vitritis and anterior uveitis. It is very important to do a good fundus examination. And like uh, Dr. Risha pointed out, it is the fundus examination that will, uh, many times we have uh, difficulties in the form of um, a small pupil or vitritis. But it is the fundus examination which will provide a clue to the diagnosis and will also help you to differentiate between a pan and an anterior uveitis. 
After that, you do your ocular investigation and laboratory investigations. There are many entities which can, uveitic entities which can have a severe form and present as pan uveitis, but I will be generally discussing BKH and an overview of Bechet's and uh, uh, sympathetic ophthalmia and uh, overview of the treatment. Now, BKH disease is a bilateral granuloma to span uveitis with extraocular manifestations involving the central nervous originally in the integumentary system. BKH has, uh, in the early presentation, BKH includes an exudative retinal detachment with focal, multifocal, or bullous uh, RDs with uh, disc hyperemia and edema. When it presents to you, usually it is bilateral, but it may be asymmetric also. And uh, at that time, you will see, because it has exudative retinal detachment, you will uh, have the differential diagnosis of CSR or uh, posterior scleritis. So how do you differentiate uh, uh, the VKH from the others? VKH has some systemic manifestations also, like some neurological manifestations like headache, meningismus, or a tinnitus. So you will see these exudative RDs with the uh, choroiditis. There are some investigations which can help you, like an FFA, which will have the pinpoint leaks. When you have extensive leaks, you can see the starry sky appearance. And you can also demonstrate the vitreous cells on uh, OCT and the hot disk, which will differentiate it from a uh, CSR. CSR will not have uh, these features. Uh, but most importantly, the ICG, will, uh, because uh, VKH is a, a stromal choroiditis, the ICG is very important. It will show these uh, small hypofluorescent dark dots, which are because of the uh, stromal choroiditis, that, uh, the stromal foci of inflammation. You can see these hypertense dark dots. And in the late phases, if the patient presents to you in the late phases, you will have features of ocular hypopigmentation, the sunset glow fundus. You have these small uh, CRA patches or the uh, subretinal gliosis and the chronic uveitis, which is usually granulomatous in the recurrent cases. And the systemic features usually will be those of uh, cutaneous hypopigmentation, like a vitilis, vitiligo, oleosis, or uh, alopecia. There may also be, uh, okay. We come to the diagnostic criteria. The original revised diagnostic criteria was published in the uh, American Journal of Ophthalmology in 2001. But uh, more recently, it has been proposed that we can use the more recent uh, in imaging techniques like uh, FFA and uh, uh, autofluorosis to give a more precise diagnosis. For example, you can use the fundus autofluorescence here. You can see that it will show the, uh, the active uh, areas here, which resolve. The OCT also picks up the uh, subretinal, uh, the SRF which resolves. But more importantly, you can see these hypotense dark uh, dots which I showed, they co-localize very well with the o OCTA. And it is these uh, phloboid areas which you can use to get uh, to, to uh, see your treatment, uh, how it can progress. For example, in this OCT also you can see. Another way is to do the uh, coronal thickening that will reduce with uh, treatment. You can see the progressive uh, decrease in the uh, thickening. Mm -hmm. It is very important to have an aggressive treatment in all these cases. Uh, it, there has been increasing evidence to show that a large number of patients can have long-term remission or even cure before uh, depigmentation occurs if you catch them in the therapeutic window. Now, this is two to three weeks following the disease onset where you have to combine these patients with the systemic steroids and a first-line immunosuppressive uh, treatment. But you should also be careful to treat the subclinical choroiditis to have a complete uh, therapy. If you miss the window, then these patients can go into a chronic VKH, which is not prone to remission, and you can have all the features of the hypopigmentation that is ocular and the uh, fundus features of hypopigmentation. The other disease is sympathetic ophthalmia, uh, which uh, is very similar to VKH, but it occurs after penetrating injury. That is the most important differentiation between uh, sympathetic ophthalmia and VKH. Most of the clinical features are the same between sympathetic ophthalmia and VKH but the systemic features appear a little less in them. And it's also important to remember that the inciting eye has the uh, penetrating injury. And very often you will not be able to see the fundus, so you should use the ultrasound to get the diffuse coronary thickening or to pick up the serous retinal detachment. Uh, the other difference is in management. Uh, usually a, a lot of sympathetic ophthalmia you can prevent by having a prompt wound closure. Enucleation of the blind eye can be, of an injured blind eye can be done, but once the disease process is apparent, enucleation is controversial. 
But in the present day scenario, with the various treatment options available like immunosuppressors, uh, we can easily have a very good uh, visual prognosis, as most of the studies have said. But it is very important to remember that we should have prompt and adequate system immunosuppression. Now, one of the diseases which has a differential diagnosis for a uh, granulomatous panuviatus is sarcoidosis, which is uncommon in the Asian Indians, but the presence of panuviatus is considered to be a poor prognostic factor. Now, the International uh, Workshop on Ocular Sarcoidosis has uh, listed these um, signs like uh, uh, mutton fat KPs, the snowballs, active or inactive peripheral choroidal lesion, the candle wax drippings, all these are put up as signs, ocular signs suggestive for uh, ocular sarcoidosis. Also, negative tuberculin test, elevated serum ACE levels, a positive chest X-ray or CT scan, and abnormal liver uh, enzymes have also been listed as the uh, necessary investigation. But all these will only give you a presumed ocular uh, sarcoidosis unless you can have a biopsy proven lesion with a compatible uveitis for a definitive uh, diagnosis of ocular sarcoidosis. <clears throat> I'll not go into the details of tuberculous panuveitis because there's a subsequent talk, but this can also be a uh, differential diagnosis of uh, granulomatous uveitis. Beshit's disease presents as a non-granulomatous panuveitis. It follows, the uveitis follows the onset of oral or genital ulcers by a few years. Uh, it is usually presents with unilateral bilateral iris cyclitis with or without hypopion. Now, this hypopion here is different from the hypopion of HLA B27, which is more uh, fibrinous there, and here it is more fluid. It's also accompanied by vitritis and papillitis and superficial or deep retinitis. The deep retinitis, when it's used, it can leave behind small wedge shaped nerve fiber nitrates. The next important thing is that it has necrotizing obliterative retinal vasculitis, which is usually a periphlebitis. Along with uh, this, this gives rise to uh, retinal hemorrhages, VRBO, CRBO, and this, if not treated aggressively, can rapidly progress to optic atrophy, the ghost vessels, and, is and ischemic retina. Um, and you can also see some thinned out retina here and some scars. Rarely, you can have a clinically calm, like this patient who presented to us with no other symptoms except symptoms due to the uh, macular hole. And it was only in the very periphery that we found two small segments of uh, vessel, which was uh, sheep. So because of that, we did an F FFA and you can find the extensive burning and the disc leak that you see. Uh, very often seen in Brushes disease, but not very typical and with a history of recurrent oral ulcers in this patient. So the international uh, criteria for uh, diagnosis of Beshit's disease gives a lot of importance to the oral ulcer and ocular ma manifestation for a scoring system that they have for diagnosing be uh, Beshit's disease. Uh, acute retinal necrosis can present either as uh, granulomatous uh, often or sometimes as non granulomatous uh, panuviatus. It is usually unilateral, but the contrary of life can, can be affected within a few months or years. The American UVIT Society classifies ARN as one or more foci of retinal necrosis with discrete borders in the peripheral retina. There is rapid progression in the absence of antiviral therapy, a circumferential spread, uh, occlusive vasculitis with arterial involvement, inflammatory reaction in the anterior chamber and vitreous with these uh, pigmented KPs. And as the retinitis heals, it leaves behind large areas of necrosis and thinning, uh, which can give rise to retinal CRP. The diagnosis is usually clinical, but PCR can help in identifying the genome of the virus. Of course, you have to give uh, antivirals, first the IV acyclovir, followed by oral acyclovir or valacyclovir, and systemic steroids after 48 hours. By and large, all the pan will usually require a combination of systemic steroids and immunosuppressors. But you have to rule out infectious uveitis and masquerades. And in some rare cases of uh, pan especially in the precious disease, you may need to use uh, biologics. The use of biologics and immunosuppressors is based on whatever experience and uh, you're comfortable with. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vinita, for giving that uh, overview of pan uveitis. So I wanted to tell you that in case of VKH, it's important to hit hard to start with the intravenous methyl prednisolone if it's the initial stage of the disease. That's quite important. Another important thing is uh, in case of sympathetic ophthalmia, now VR surgery is one of the important causes of sympathetic ophthalmia. Instead of penetrating trauma or uh, surgical trauma, this vitreoretinal surgery has come out to a 
one of the common cause of uh, um, sympathetic ophthalmia. These are the two points I thought that I will highlight. It. Next is uh, Dr. Natasha. Risha is. Dr. Natasha Radhakrishnan, she is a professor and Regina specialist at the Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. She has several national and international publications to her credit and has presented papers in various state and national forums. Over to you, Dr. Natasha, for her talk on pediatric uveitis. Risha, Dr. Chi has joined. Professor Chi has. Uh, not yet, sir. Okay. Uh, six five. Uh, it's not yet. Sir. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, yes, Dr. Madesh. Uh, thank you to uh, Cochin of Thalmi Club, Dr. Gopal and Dr. Biswas for this uh, opportunity. My talk is on pediatric uveitis. Um, it is uh, an uncommon disease, childhood uveitis, with an incidence of about 3 in 1 lakh in 0 to 4 years and 6 in 1 lakh in 10 to 14 years. The most common cause is idiopathic and the most common manifestation is a chronic anterior uveitis. Though in 8 to 16 years, we do see intermediate uveitis as the most common manifestation. The commonest types of uveitis by age less than 6 years, it is usually a chronic anterior uveitis due to juvenile idiopathic arthritis. In 7 to 12 years, it is commonly idiopathic chronic anterior uveitis and intermediate uveitis. And in older age group, we also expect the B27 associated uveitis. The IUSG same classification is followed as in adult uveitis anatomically into anterior, intermediate, posterior and pan uveitis based on time course into acute, chronic and recurrent and based on the cause into granulomatous and non-granulomatous. The features of anterior uveitis in children are the same as in adults with uh, keratic precipitates which may be of various uh, sizes. The festooned pupil due to the synechae, posterior subcapsular cataract as a consequence, pigments on anterior lens can capsule but uh, commonly they also have this complication called band shaped keratopathy because most of these children have chronic uveitis. This is another picture of band shaped keratopathy. The causes are many so I will not go into the list but uh, the intermediate uveitis though we have done it in detail already can be uh, sarcoidosis, chronic cyclitis, Bechet's, Lyme disease, multiple sclerosis and also idiopathic. Posterior uveitis again very similar to adult uveitis. Uh, it could be toxoplasmosis, it could be the tuberculosis with the granulomas or the tubercles, the tubercular abscess and sometimes the toxocara uh, granuloma in the periphery. You can also have vasculitis which may be arterial or periphlebitis with the candle wax drippings or combined arterial and venous. Uh, vasculitis. One thing that we have to keep in mind when we are treating uveitis in children are the masquerade syndromes with retinoblastoma heading the pack. We can also see it sometimes in retin retinitis pigmentosa when there is pigment dispersion into the anterior segment in chronic retinal detachments, leukemias, lymphomas, juvenile xanthogranulomas can also present as uveitis. And these are some of the cases that have come as masquerade to our clinic. The little bit more about juvenile idiopathic arthritis which is the most common systemic association of anterior uveitis in children. The risk factors are females, oligoarticular arthritis, younger age group, ANA positivity, they are always RF negative, usually bilateral and non-granulomatous. The complications are band-shaped keratopathy, cataract, posterior synechae, secondary glaucoma, cystoid macular edema and subsequent to all this they develop amblyopia too. The most important thing is that they are asymptomatic and therefore unless you have been screening the juvenile idiopathic arthritis children, they will come to you with advanced eye problems like all these complications that we mentioned. It is usually a white eye and they have a chronic course and the topical medications when we are treating these children we have to remember that topical medications have only an adjunctive role and if you need more than three drops for more than three months of topical steroids you have to uh, the child should be put on systemic immunosuppression. Slow tapering of the topical steroids is necessary with constant monitoring and screening of these children with juvenile idiopathic arthritis is mandatory. 
The other spondyloarthropathies contribute 15% of pediatric uveitis and can include juvenile AS, juvenile reiters, juvenile psoriatic arthritis, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. In these conditions, boys are more commonly affected more than 8 years of age. It is an acute recurrent uveitis that is bilateral and sometimes asymmetric and most of them are positive for HLA B27 and RF negative. They present severe acute anterior uveitis and hypopion formation. Inflammatory bowel disease is usually associated with a mild arthritis in children and they also commonly present with acute anterior uveitis and episcleritis. 6% of children with Crohn's disease will have acute anterior uveitis. Sarcoidosis can also be seen in children and can present with anterior uveitis and all these complications that we mentioned earlier and sometimes inflammation in the posterior segment in the form of retinal periphlebitis or multifocal choroiditis can be seen. This unusual case was a 10-month-old female baby with abdominal distension, recurrent loose stools and progressive skin lesions and failure to gain weight. General examination showed depigmented hair, hypopigmented scaly lesions and oral candidiasis. Ophthalmic examination showed bilateral anterior uveitis with festooned pupil and no view of the posterior segment. Investigations also showed the skin biopsy showed ill-formed granulomas with Langhans giant cells. Liver biopsy showed granulomatous inflammation with Schaumann bodies and this was the histology specimen of the skin and liver. The stool was positive for occult blood and uh, since the NOD2 gene mutation was negative, the, we made a diagnosis of infantile sarcoidosis. The patient improved well with systemic immunosuppression and topical steroids, underwent cataract surgery in one and is now on follow-up and doing well. Early onset childhood sarcoidosis is a rare disease and appears to be different from sarcoid in older children. It occurs in approximately half the cases. Liver biopsy is an important diagnostic uh, tool and patients uh, have to be differentiated from the blouse syndrome, familial juvenile systemic granulomatosis which is autosomal dominant and again characterized by granulomatous polyarthritis and skin rash and it can very closely resemble sarcoidosis in young children. Bechet's uveitis, pediatric Bechet's uveitis is defined as onset of uveitis at 16 years of age or younger and mean age is the late childhood, male predominance, family history may be present, bilateral involvement is usually seen, recurrent pan uveitis with retinal vasculitis. Now, how do we treat these children? Local treatment of non-infectious uveitis, the main treatment is corticosteroids, topical corticosteroids for the anterior segment inflammation, periocular or subtenant corticosteroids for intermediate or posterior uveitis for the treatment of cystoid macular edema and they need treatment of their complications the cataract will require cataract surgery and here we have to proceed with caution since severe exudative reaction is the norm and we need a three months activity free interval stepping up systemic immunosuppression two weeks prior to is essential and continue for a month after with slow taper of systemic and topical steroids Band-shaped keratopathy can be treated with EDTA chelation and phototherapeutic keratectomy. Cystoid macular edema will require either a posterior subtenant triamcinolone and sometimes will require your, uh, the ozodex intravitreal ozodex implant. This case was uh, it was had so many twists and turns and uh, it was like a, a roller coaster ride for us. Three year old boy who was diagnosed outside to have bilateral non granulomatous uveitis and anterior segment showed band shaped keratopathy festooned pupil with anterior segment activity in both eyes. The fundus appeared normal. He was started on systemic methotrexate and topical steroids. He was doing well but one year press after presentation he had a thick BSK for which he underwent bilateral phototherapeutic keratectomy. Following this, his visual acuity improved at 636. However, a year later, the cataract progressed. So, he underwent bilateral cataract surgery with IOL and vision improved to 618 and 624. One year later, he developed an organized membrane behind the IOL in the left eye and uh, he underwent a membranectomy. But post membranectomy, the left eye vision dropped to PL present. B scan was done which showed a thick detached posterior hyaloid with severe vitritis, no significant choroidal thickening or disc edema and the VEP was normal. So we went ahead with uh, in, uh, stepping up of his immunosuppression, adalimumab was started and he was given an intravitreal osurtex. And this time the post implantation vision improved to 6 by 60 and the vitreous appeared a bit clearer. 
The child was lost to follow up due to economic concerns for about three months, but came back again practically blind. Right eye counting fingers and left eye was two by sixty. Now a thick membrane had formed in front of the lens in the right eye, and recurrence of the yellow glow with vitreous in the left eye. He underwent right eye surgical anterior membranectomy and left eye another implantation of dexamethasone implant. Again, vision recovered to six twenty four and six eighteen, and uh, currently he is doing well. So patience, perseverance, and appropriate diagnosis. diagnosis of the complications timely intervention will give you a good outcome in many of these patients sometimes you may have to go in surgically with a vitrectomy like this child with bilateral pan uveitis severe vitreous haze complicated cataract and had hypotony due to ciliary shutdown hand movements in one eye 6 by 60 in the other eye so we had to go in for cataract surgery with vitrectomy and oil and she is currently maintaining at 6 12 both eyes but we are not able to take out her silicon oil So vitrectomy sometimes is needed for diagnosis in these children but mostly needed for therapeutic when there is vitreous and severe hypotony due to cyclitic membrane or an associated dermatogenous retinal detachment with small gauge vitrectomy now we have very little morbidity in these children in conclusion pediatric uveitis is a challenging subspecialty and it requires close cooperation with the rheumatologist and the ophthalmologist to ensure accurate diagnosis and optimum treatment outcomes thank you very much Thank you, Natasha. There is a very good presentation given given an overview of the pediatric uveitis. I want to mention the two points. One is that the GIA patient, once you see them, you really impress them, the parents, that it's important to have periodic checkup because they may have a quiet eye with uh, ongoing inflammation. Methotrexate is a very good option in these cases, and if not responding, one can go for an injection aglutinumab. Which is also very good in GIA. And intermediate uveitis in the children is having a often a chronic course, and such patients is also respond well with the uh, immunomodulatory agents like methotrexate. Now we'll go for tubercular uveitis, which is a bugbear and uh, is that uh, controversy. There is a lot of controversy in in treatment and diagnosis of that. Uh, before introducing the next speaker, I would like to invite uh, Doctor. Uh, just introduce Doctor Soon Kechi, our international speaker. Here she has joined. Here, welcome, Madam. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Chi. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next, it's my pleasure to invite Doctor Rima Bansal. She is an additional professor at PGI Chandigarh. she has uh, many publications in peer reviewed journals with the uh, 26 chapters in various books she has 10 awards to her credit and she has delivered around 150 guest lectures in national and international conferences she is an elected member of international uveit study group and national academy of medical sciences she is a member of scientific committee uveit society of india and reviewing editor of ocular immunology and inflammations she is a sub editor of uh, indian journal of ophthalmology over to you madam for her talk on uh, tubercular uveitis challenge in diagnosis and treatment so thank you risha and uh, many thanks to dr biswas and uh, dr gopal for having me in this session so i'll be talking on tubercular uveitis uh, challenges in diagnosis and its treatment so a little bit of background on tb uveitis the as considered by who tb is a global burden emerging as a common cause of uveitis especially in endemic countries like us it's site threatening and the major challenge being having no consensus on treatment with anti tb therapy with or without steroids so the current practices are largely driven by the experience and the local practices of the physicians so we have a significant clinical diagnostic and therapeutic challenge when we talk of tb uveitis so if you look at the clinical challenges it's mainly because of extremely wide spectrum of the uh, entity almost any sign can be a part of tb uveitis and it any sign can be caused by uveitis other than tb so we need to distinguish between tb and non tb etiologies the diagnostic challenges are because of lack of any uniform diagnostic criteria 
especially because the patients usually present without any concurrent active pulmonary TB. Of course, the, the lack of possibility of having smear or culture positive reports from the ocular fluids, limited sensitivities and specificities of the PCRs. So we have only corroborative evidence in the form of tubicle and skin test or Pontiferon TB gold, and we'll come to that later. Coming to the therapeutic challenges, because the diagnosis is presumptive, so ETT is usually given empirically, and what we are actually treating is treating latent TB, because these patients do not have manifest TB. We have issues of compliance and uh, hepatotoxicity with the anti-TB therapy. There are issues of recurrences of uveitis despite giving ATT. Paradoxical worsening when we start ATT, and some of the cases of choroiditis present with inflammatory choroidal neovascularization. So clinical challenges, as I said, the it could be anterior uveitis in any form, acute, chronic, granulomatous or non-granulomatous. Any sign involving the retina or choroid can be part of TB spectrum. So to solve some of these um, dilemmas, we conducted many studies from our own database, from our own patients, and to some extent, we got a few answers in the sense that if you talk about the clinical signs, broad-based posterior sinicae, retinal vasculitis, and serpiginous lycoroditis were the signs which were highly predictive of TB etiology. If we find latent TB along with these signs, we treat with ATT. From Dr. Chi's group from Singapore, the duration of ATT is recommended to be at least nine months if you have to have good outcome with minimi minimization of recurrences. When we talk of imaging, fundus autofluorescence is a very reliable and quick tool for diagnosing and monitoring serpiginous lycoroditis. And coming to PCRs, the limited sensitivities restrict their use, and especially the invasive nature of the ocular sampling restrict the use of PCRs from the ocular fluids. The diagnostic challenges are mainly what tests to use and how to interpret. Now, if we talk about the immunological test, that is the tuberculin skin test or the quantiferon TB gold, the dilemma is whether to use TST or quantiferon or both. So what we follow is we do the TST and the limitations of quantiferon TB gold in terms of increased cost, and there is limited data of its use in uveitis. So this is the most common limiting factor of quantiferon TB gold. So as per the recommendations by the CDC, this test can usually be in place of TST and not in addition to TST. So moreover, and the WHO has banned this test as a screening test because we have other reliable tests at much an affordable price. So this is the almost 11 years ago, this study was, uh, the study highlighted the role of Quantiferon TB gold in uh, uveitis and pointed out that it was only slightly superior to the TST in diagnosing TB uveitis. Coming to which radiological test to use, X-ray versus CT chest. So from our experience, we found that in patients with uveitis who are usually symptomatically, is, uh, systemically asymptomatic, the CT chest helps, helped us to establish the diagnosis of either tuberculosis or sarcoidosis in patients with granulomatous uveitis in more than 70% of the cases using only clinical or clinical radiological criteria. I'm not talking about the patients who underwent biopsy of the lymph nodes. So the protocol that we follow in our clinic is when we see a patient of uveitis, if you follow the left arm, there are a few entities which are just diagnosed by the history, clinical examination and ancillary testing like acute anterior uveitis, VKH, toxoplasma, Bechet's disease, acute retinal necrosis, and so on. So these entities, if we see clinically and identify them, usually do not require the testing of TB tests, but the entities which require additional specific testing are the ones which could point towards TB, sarcoid, syphilis, or remain undetermined. So we do a tuberculin skin test at the first go, along with CT chest and TPHA. TPHA we always do to rule out syphilis because it's a great mimicker. Quantiferon TB gold we reserve for only those patients where we don't have the tuberculin skin test results or the patient is already carrying the report. Otherwise, it's an expensive test and may not be done along with TST. The third test is PCR whether to do it or if yes, when to do it. So we have various, we have uh, tested various PCRs and we found that all of them have different sensitivities and limited specificities. The availability of the test is also limited to only few centers and the invasive nature of the ocular sampling. So all these factors limit its use to be preferred only when we have no clinical or laboratory clues available 
or when the patient has responded, uh, has shown failure to treatment, especially in the, in the presence of good expertise and good laboratory facility. Coming to the therapeutic challenges, if you look at the uh, therapeutic challenges, as I said, the first one is uh, the toxicity associated with the anti-tubercular therapy. The mild ones are nausea and vomiting, which are tolerable, but LFTs need regular monitoring and hepatotoxicity is one of the major concerns. Long duration of ATTs, of course, needs a good compliance from the patient. And with now the thambutol being given for all the months for the entire duration of ATT, we are seeing an increased incidence of thambutol toxicity. Recurrence is, as I said, even if you treat these patients with uh, uh, latent TB with anti-TB therapy, it significantly reduces to 85% uh, uh, success rate, but there is a subset of 15% of patients who still go on to develop recurrence of uveitis and they present a major challenge. Paradoxical worsening is a major issue with the start of uh, anti-TB therapy, especially seen in the first few weeks. Although it can be controlled within step up of immunosuppression or corticosteroids, but it leads to a significant visual morbidity. So these patients require a very close follow-up when we start anti-TB therapy. So this is an example if you see on top left, the patient presented with uh, multifocal lesions of serpiginous like choroditis. We started steroids and anti-TB therapy. And two weeks later, you can see the, there is a number of, there is an increase in the number and the size of the lesions. We could control with the hike in steroids and we could restore the vision to 6-9, but you may not be lucky all the time. Choroidal granulomas have a very increased vascularize, uh, vascularization and that poses a major challenge. But the good part of choroidal granulomas is that in addition to steroids and ATT, they respond very well to anti intravitreal anti-VEGF injections. So this may be considered as an adjunct to the conventional anti-TB therapy and steroids. We now seeing an increasing incidence of inflammatory choroidal neovascular membranes, in, especially in patients with serpiginous like choroiditis or any form of TB choroiditis. So this is an important factor which needs to be seen when we are following up these patients after treatment. So subtle lesions in the form of uh, hemorrhage or fluid or sudden drop in vision must put a high index of suspicion for an inflammatory CNVM. So answering all these dilemmas, we have good, extremely uh, invaluable contribution by the COTS. This was a global collaborative initiative between the IOIS, IOSG, and the COTS study group to consolidate the expertise of the international uveitis experts to address the challenges in diagnosis and management of ocular TB. So if you look at the objectives of COTS, look at the second one, which is to understand how the experts diagnose and manage intraocular TB. So we have a number of reports from COTS, so I'll just highlight a few of them which are addressing our talk today. The first report addressed the global variations and challenges with TB uveitis. And this report said that majority of them were the ones which were from Asian ethnicity. The mean age was they were younger patients. Immigrants followed a good proportion. Most of the patients, as I said before, did not have any symptoms of pulmonary TB. It was bilateral in many of them. And almost all who had underwent an immunological test, about 90% of them had a positive test when they presented with the suspected tubercular uveitis. Second report addressed the clinical features and outcomes of patients treated with anti-TB therapy, and they found that the anti-TB therapy did lead to low- One minute failure. more, ma'am. Please conclude. Okay. Yeah, so I'm about to finish. So the um, worst prognostic factors were associated with pan-uveitis and choroiditis. Third report, as I said, PCR has limited availability and should be used only when required. So th this COTS gave us the consensus to initiate ATT in three subtypes of TB choroiditis. So if you have TB choroiditis, positive results from any one of the positive immunological tests along with radiological features of TB, you go for ATT. And if you have TB SLC or choroidal granuloma, even one positive immunological test, even if you don't have any radiological test positive, one can start anti-TB therapy. To summarize, the pearls for clinical practice of TB uveitis, we need to identify the clinical signs. CT chest gives us good valuable inputs. Imaging should be performed relevant to the diagnosis, especially fundus autofluorescence for serpiginous lycorhoditis. PCRs only when required and available. Ensure the compliance of the patient to ATT and have a high index of suspicion for inflammatory CNVMs in TB choroiditis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, madam. Thank you. That was an excellent talk. Uh, yeah. 
The next uh, talk is by Dr. Somiya Basu uh, regarding regional vasculitis. He is the head of UVIT services, little, uh, LV Prasad Eye Institute. His research interests are immunopathogenesis of ocular tuberculosis, role of autoimmunity in infectious UVITs. He has won several awards and he has many publications to his credit and he has written uh, book chapters in nine ophthalmology books. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Risha. Uh, that was a kind introduction. I need to share my slide first. Yeah, there it is. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Gopal and Risha for, and definitely JB, sir, for inviting me to this wonderful uh, program. The presentation I'm making today is uh, essentially work of my former colleague, uh, Rishkesh Kaza. So retinal vasculitis, we must understand, is a clinical diagnosis which is associated with uh, inflammation of the retinal blood vessels or with ischemia of the retina. We, When we look at a patient of retinal vasculitis, there are two uh, points that we should focus on. One is the type of the vessel with this focusing on the size and uh, whether it's a uh, artery or a vein or both of them. And the other part is the associated clinical signs. And most of my presentation is going to be around these two points today. I'm not going into the details of investigation and uh, treatment. So if you look at systemic vasculitis, uh, which is essentially based on the histopathological uh, characterization of intravascular inflammation that has been divided into three different types based on the size of the vessel and these are the large vessel the medium and the small vessels and the causes of each of these are uh, the large vessel is takayasu and giant cell medium is pan and kawasaki while the other immune mediated diseases uh, and the immune complex uh, diseases these fall under the small vessel vasculitis. Now, knowing the size of the retinal blood vessels, all of the retinal vasculitis is small vessel vasculitis. The problem is that in case of retinal vasculitis, we do not have a histopathological evidence to tell that we are uh, dealing with inflammation of the blood vessel walls. However, we have the advantage of directly visualizing the changes in the blood vessels uh, uh, under the ophthalmoscope, which is not possible for the systemic vasculitis, which are made uh, under the pathologist's microscope. So let's look at some of the morphological patterns. Uh, many of these images are from uh, my other colleague, Dr. Abhinash Patangi. And this is one pattern where we see a skip vasculitis. There are multiple patches of perivascular exudates uh, that you see over here. We, we call this as skip vasculitis. This is not specific for a particular cause of uh, vasculitis, but uh, this is one pattern that we see. The other is a confluent vasculitis, which extend like a pipe stem all along the blood vessel. Then, of course, there's a frosted branch angitis, and there's a Kyrilis vasculitis. It's, of course, controversial whether we should at all call this a vasculitis or not. You can see the uh, thickening in the vessel walls, the deposits in the vessel walls that we uh, call as Kyrilis vasculitis, very commonly seen in toxoplasmosis, but also in other conditions. And then there is a condition where we do not see any perivascular exudation, but uh, we see a gross ischemia of the retina as shown in, in this uh, fluorescein angiogram. This is most common with Takayasu's arthritis, but it should also be suspected for APLA syndrome and for Suzak syndrome. Now, this was about the morphological uh, patterns of vasculitis. What type of blood vessels are being involved? How is the inflammation presented in the blood vessels? Now, along with the type of vasculitis, we also look at the associated clinical signs. 
and these are now very well characterized for tuberculosis we just heard about tb in the last talk uh, especially for tb endemic countries this may not apply to non endemic countries so some of the characteristics are the subvascular lesions which we have found histopathologically to be retinitis lesions intra retinal lesions that you can see here uh, over here and these when they heal they appear as these pigmented scars the other uh, clinical finding that we found suggestive of uh, tb in our population are something that we call as focal vascular tortuosities which uh, is uh, shown here in the inset uh, in the red free photograph and the third characteristic which again can be seen in many many infectious and non infectious conditions but along with the other two is very suggestive of tb uveitis is the occlusive vasculitis as shown here by the capillary non perfusion in the fluorescein angiogram now these are for tb for sarcoid uh, apart from what is classically described in the textbooks as candle wax drippings and skip vasculitis you can also look for these discrete hyperpigmented scars in the inferior fundus which are very characteristic of sarcoidosis and then the granulomatous uh, anterior uveitis with the peripheral anterior synechia again the peripheral anterior synechia being very very characteristic of sarcoidosis then for bechet's disease uh, we have this uh, mobile hypopion over here and we see this uh, perivascular sheathing along both uh, arterioles and venules and this appears like a fern like pattern when we uh, see it on the fluorescein angiogram very characteristic of bechet's disease so th these are only some of the conditions that uh, we uh, we are describing here but of course for all other causes of retinal vasculitis also we can find specific clinical patterns that will lead us to the further investigations now about the pathogenesis why what actually happens because we are not seeing the actual inflammation of the vessel walls so what actually is happening when we see the perivascular exudation so there is a disruption of the uh, tight endothelial junctions or the inner blood retinal barrier and there is exudation in the space between the pericytes and the glia limitans of the vessel wall which is called as the virkau robin space so this is what we see as the perivascular exudation but why is it that we see venules more commonly than the arterioles in the most common form of retinal vasculitis is the periphlebitis one of the reasons is that the uh, retinal venules unlike the retinal arterioles these serve as the high endothelial uh, venules in the absence of a lymphatic system so when the naive t, t cells enter these uh, endothelial venules to sample foreign antigens which is why the involvement of venules is way more uh, likely than the involvement of the arterioles now how do you approach the diagnosis i'm not talking about the individual investigations here but the way we are approaching all forms of uveitis now is to essentially decide is there a, an infection playing a role here and i'm talking about a direct role of an infection or is it a non infectious disease with a systemic involvement or is it a non infectious disease with a eye limited pattern of involvement if we can classify it into one of these three then like any other form of uveitis we should be able to decide our treatment now if the veins are more commonly involved we look for the associated clinical signs of tb the subvascular lesions and the vascular occlusion if these are not present we look for signs of non infectious systemic disease where sarcoid is most common the candle wax drippings the string of pearls or the uh, peripheral chorioretinal lesions which suggest sarcoidosis but there can be other causes also such as multiple sclerosis or intermediate uveitis and the associated clinical signs will lead you to these causes and then there is a bird shot chorioretinopathy which of course we don't see in our country but this is a eye limited form of retinal vasculitis you see the bird shot lesions in addition now if the arterioles are more commonly involved then uh, you see these conditions associated with retinitis infectious retinitis such as acute retinal necrosis or syphilis 
the non infectious conditions are sle or pan and then there is a non infectious i limited involvement of uh, uh, the arterioles which is called as irvan uh if there is involvement of both the venules and arterioles then uh, toxoplasmosis is one common infectious cause while in the non infectious causes bechet's disease is the most infect common cause then finally there is this condition where we do not see the perivascular exudation here the takayasu arteritis the apla and uh, suzak syndrome are the common causes so i think this is one approach that is very useful for us uh, in leading us to the appropriate investigations and thereafter the diagnosis and sir one more me of these patients here is an example presenting with uh, retinal vasculitis and the uh, intra and the uh, submacular exudation and when we did the uh, fluorescein angiogram we could see these not uh, aneurysms here which led us to the diagnosis of irvan the treatment straightforward if there is an underlying infection treated anti inflammatory therapy could be with steroids or with non steroidal immune suppressives but retinal vasculitis often needs ancillary therapy either as local therapy with anti vegfs or steroids laser photocoagulation or pass pena vitrectomy for management of the complications Here is an example of treatment of TB uh, uveitis with anti-TB therapy alone. You see the perivenous exudation and the retinitis lesion here, and with four months of anti-TB therapy alone, we see the resolution of the lesions. So, thank you for your attention, and thanks again for inviting me. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Samia. Say. Say you are muted. Yeah, Dr. JB, you are muted, sir. The gross capillary non-perfusion, you can see the nasally, and uh, that's often in vision-threatening conditions. We don't see that much in here, but uh, it's one of the disease which you should keep in back of mind if you see in the retinal vasculitis, particularly seen in the young female. now we have got our friend dr shunfechi my good friend she will be giving us the cataract surgery in uveitis risha yes sir it's my pleasure to invite dr shunfechi for the session uh, so professor shunfechi is the distinguished professor of clinical education in ophthalmology at duke international university of singapore medical school and professor at the national university of singapore she is a senior consultant at singapore national eye institute eye center professor chi's research interests in cataract include the management of complicated cataracts she is also known for uh, inventing number of surgical instruments for the management of complex cataract surgeries in the field of uveitis she has been the president of Asia Pacific Intraocular Inflammation Study Group since 2013, and a member of the International UVIT Study Group, and an international council member of the IOIS. She has published extensively on cytomegalovirus infection in the anterior segment in immunocompetent patient, ocular tuberculosis, dengue, and VKH disease. she has authored over 200 peer reviewed scientific papers and many book chapters she serves as a member of several editorial boards including journal of cataract and refractive surgery ocular inflammation and immunology and journal of ophthalmic inflammation and infection she was the editor of the book emerging infectious uveitis she is also a much sought out speaker at numerous international regional and national conferences and has made her presentations on uveitis and cataract and has delivered several named lectures and won medals for her surgeries over to you madam for uh, her keynote address on cataract surgery in uveitis thank you so much everyone 
for including me in this wonderful webinar. And um, I'll start by sharing my screen. I've, um, sorry, can I just go back? Um, I've actually uh, pre-recorded my talk so that I can stay actually in time. Um, oh dear. Sorry, I think my... Can you see my screen yet? Uh, not yet, ma'am. Okay. Mm. Can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. All right, great. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Risha and Dr. Jotime Biswas for inviting me to participate in this webinar, and I'll be speaking on cataract surgery in uveitis. These are my financial disclosures with no relevance to my talk today. Cataract in eyes with uveitis is a common complication. The outcome depends upon the uveitic diagnosis, pre-existing structural damage, especially to the cornea, optic nerve, and retina, perioperative management of inflammation, and surgery. In planning surgery, the first most important step is to assess the patient's visual potential. Is the cataract responsible for the poor visual equity? We must assess the patient's visual potential to set the expectations right. We want to look at the cornea, whether there are any corneal scars, endothelial cell count should be done. The optic nerve assessment with the optical coherence tomography is very useful, and also assessing the macula with the OCT to look for macular edema or even a macular hole or a CNV that we should be treating before surgery are very, very important. We want to assess the risk for complications after surgery, especially in eyes with the risk of hypotony. We want to image the cerebral body with a UBM. We want to look at the zonules also with a UBM. If a patient has had previous vitrectomies or intravitreal injections, we want to examine the posterior capsule carefully in case it has been breached. In eyes with bent keratopathy, we want to decide whether this should be done before cataract surgery or as a combined procedure. Timing of surgery is very important. The eye should be quiescent for a minimum of three months prior to surgery. If we are short of the three months, we can run intravenous methylprednisolone one gram daily for three days prior to the surgery. For Bacchus disease, it's been advised that the eye should be inactive for a minimum of six months. Fly meter monitoring is a useful tool to know when the eye is quiescent. Now, the next important question to answer is whether or not to implant an intraocular lens. The intraocular lens is not contraindicated if you have optimum control of inflammation in the eye. And if you do implant the lens, it should be in the back implantation. You should avoid silicone lenses, avoid anterior chamber lenses. If you do rupture the posterior capsule, it's better to let a cataract surgeon come back and secondarily implant the lens if there is inadequate capsular support. You also want to avoid an intraocular lens if the child is younger than two years old. Now, considerations for anti-inflammatory prophylaxis, the indications include if you have to manipulate the iris significantly, patients who have had previous macular edema whenever they had inflammation, patients with pan uveitis, inadequately controlled uveitis and an only eye patient. Anti-inflammatory prophylaxis can take the form of topical NSAIDs, preoperative oral corticosteroid 0.5 mg per kilogram body weight three days prior, or today I prefer to give intraoperative injections, intracaramel dexamethasone 0.4 mg at 0.1 mL, or we can give intravitreal trimcinolone acetonide or intravitreal dexamethasone implant, which can last up to four months postoperatively. There was no difference found when comparing oral versus intravitreal, oral versus dexamethasone implant as prophylaxis. How about anti uh, toxoplasma therapy and antiviral therapy? Now, for prophylaxis against toxoplasma, this is controversial. It was suggested initially that lesions near the macula or near the optic nerve would be better off receiving prophylaxis a week prior using Bactrim double strength. However, in a recent paper from Germany, it has been shown that really there was no difference in these patients whether they received uh, prophylaxis for toxoplasma or not. 
Now for antiviral therapy, I would recommend in patients who have had previous herpes, anterior uveitis, or involving the cornea, that they should receive acyclovir 400 milligrams twice a day or Valtrex 0.5 or 1 gram daily prior to surgery and to continue this as long as topical steroids are given. For CMV patients, I prefer to use either topical gel, gencyclovir, or oral prophylaxis. Now at the time of surgery, you may encounter a patient with kyphosis from ankylosing spondylitis, and the best way to position him on the operating table is to put him in tender lumbar position. Pupil enlargement can be done with medications pharmacologically, and I routinely use 0.5 mL, 1 in 1,000 epinephrine, and 500 mL of BSS in my irrigation. And I use some of this at the start of surgery after a paracentesis to try to get the pupil to the maximal dilation. Now this patient here, you can see just injecting BSS with adrenaline helps the pupil to get uh, better dilated. And then using uh, dispersive viscoelastic or viscoadaptive, we can then just release the sinica and inject and make this pupil larger. So pupil enlargement with no devices can be used, uh, can be done with retentive viscoelastic. Uh, pupillary membrane, if they are present, they should be removed. This will unbind the pupil to allow it to expand. If there's posterior sinica, we can release this using a Kuglen hook, which is a push and pull instrument, which is very useful to release 360 degrees of posterior sinica. And then we can stretch the pupil uh, using two Kuglen hooks. However, if, as we stretch, we see that a rib is beginning to develop. We must stop. And so in non-stretchable iris, it's better to use limited sphincterotomies and cut only the sphincter pupillae as you can see here it's just the 1 mm within the pupil and if there is peripheral anterior sinicia this should always be released before addressing the posterior sinicia. Now this patient here the membrane is partial so there's this seclusial membrane we go from the area of uh, unattached iris to release the rest of the sinicia and you can see that was nicely done with Coughlin hook and then we remove this membrane and you can see you can proceed with surgery safely because the pupil really is wide enough. This patient has occlusal pupillae. In order to lift an edge, what I do is I lift the iris so that the membrane is lifted off the anterior capsule and then you can gradually peel the membrane away from the edge of the pupil to unbind the pupil. And I'm using a micro capsulorexis forceps to do this, taking care that I do not puncture the anterior capsule in the process and then you remove it as completely as you can and if you cannot completely remove it you can just snip the iris where it is still adherent and then to enlarge it further you use pup iris hooks. This eye has peripheral anterior sinicia which we're going to attend to now before attending to the posterior sinicia and you can see we can do this mechanically by using the viscoelastic cannula edge to just nudge the iris off the endothelium doing this very carefully to ensure we do not cause a rip in Desmay's membrane and once we've opened up the angle we can then uh, begin to attend to the posterior sinicia. You can see a membrane binding the pupil in this very uh, stiff, non-distensible iris that is chronically scarred. And in order to do this safely, what we're doing is providing counterforce from micro grasper coming in from a side port. And once we provide the counter traction, we're able to safely remove this membrane, which is binding and keeping the pupil small. And once we have done that, uh, what we can do is to enlarge the pupil further by means of iris hooks. We do not want to use a malugan uh, dilator as that will uh, incur a rip in this iris. And you can see that once we have got the hooks in, we can combine it even with sphincterotomies. Now this is the Bela pupil dilator that we can use and reuse for patients who are cost conscious and we can use this to then dilate the pupil evenly and these are like multiple Kuglen hooks that we then latch onto the pupil edge and expand the pupil after holding it there for a couple of seconds walking this instrument carefully out through the incision and you can see a nice round well dilated pupil. This small pupil is bound by some membrane across the pupil so we release uh, the posterior sinicia with a cannula sweeping action and then remove the membrane with uh, capsulorexis uh, forceps 
and then we reload on the Malugin ring dilator and insert the scrolls just under the pupil edge and for the trailing scroll we retract the iris with the Coughlin hook to aid this. In these cases the pupil must be able to stretch. Now we remove this by first removing the trailing scroll and then compressing the two lateral scrolls as they come through. So this is a patient here with a small pupil that had sphincterotomies done and we had done a small capsulexis. It's important to enlarge this at the end of surgery to ensure that the patient does not develop capsular phimosis and then here we're giving trimethylone acetonide. This patient developed capsular phimosis one month after surgery causing the vision to drop from 6-9 to counting fingers. You can see the subcapsular fibrosis underneath the anterior capsule developing 360 degrees around the capsule opening. I'm holding on to the anterior capsule with non tooth forceps as I release the tenacious membrane from under the anterior capsule 360 degrees around. I'm not afraid to hold on to the capsule because I'm using non tooth forceps. You must not use tooth forceps on the anterior capsule as this will cause a rip. Once the membrane has been removed, you can see that the anterior capsule folds are now released and I inject more dispersive viscoelastic into the capsular bag, expand it and insert a capsule tension ring to stabilize the zonules which are weak. We then create a little nick in the anterior capsule to enlarge the capsular axis because the small capsule opening was part of the reason why phimosis developed. Now, this is a pediatric case, a patient with juvenile idiopathic uh, arthritis with uveitis, and you can see the peripheral anterior sinic here, here. And what we're doing is first releasing that. And after doing that, we then release the posterior sinic here with sweeping actions just of a viscoelastic cannula. And that comes off easily. We then remove these uh, membranes by a circular uh, peeling action. And once we have released the membrane, the pupil dilates better. And there's a small eye like this, it's always better you use iris hooks than a pupil uh, dilator like a Malugin ring. And we then create a capsular axis of adequate size. Sometimes it can be difficult to visualize. This lens is pretty um, advanced already for a pediatric case. And then we aspirate the lens and inject viscoelastic. And then I'm puncturing the posterior capsule with a 27 gauge needle, inject some dispersive viscoelastic there to push away the uh, vitreous. And then with the capsulorexis forceps, I'm then doing a posterior capsulorexis. You can do this with a vitrectomy machine as well. And then a limited anterior vitrectomy, injecting uh, trimcinolone to stain the vitreous to ensure I remove adequate amounts just behind to avoid that scaffold forming behind the posterior capsule and then injecting a single piece uh, intraocular lens into the anterior chamber first and then levering it carefully into the capsular bag. This way we are sure it does not go through the posterior capsule. Now sometimes a big pupil is also no good. So in this patient here you can see the patient had one episode of herpes zoster developed diffuse uh, iris atrophy with a severe uveitis and you can see this pupil does not come down it's got uh, atrophy it's got transillumination and causing a lot of problems so first we stain the uh, capsule with tripen blue and then inject a capsule tension ring ensure that the capsule axis is about 5.5 mm and then in this case in a brown iris we're then using a standard um, brown uh, artificial iris and this is made of silicon and since we're injecting it into the capsular bag it's without fiber and we're folding this and we can then introduce this manually although today I use a medi uh, cell injector to introduce it through a small incision this is 3mm incision and uh, with injector you can introduce it through a 2.4mm incision we then hold on to the pupil edge and then gradually just middle plate this into the capsular bag and at the end of it it's important to ensure that you remove all the viscoelastic and suture the incision or make sure it's watertight and you can see then this is the patient's excellent outcome. 
Post operative management is extremely important. These patients should all be treated with intensive topical PrEP forte with or without oral steroids and topical NSAIDs. We should monitor the inflammation with the laser flare meter where available and also the macular status with an optical coherence tomography. If there are any complications, these should be treated aggressively and we want to prevent fibrin posterior sinica reformation, recurrence of inflammation, and hypotony. And where necessary, we may need to inject an Ozodex injection to the back of the eye to control the inflammation. So, in conclusion, the key to success include proper patient selection, preoperative and postoperative control of inflammation is crucial to achieving a good visual outcome in uveating eyes. Avoid implanting an intraocular lens if inflammation is not adequately controlled. Good surgical technique, of course, is very important and anticipatory management of postoperative complications. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Shunpek. Wonderful lecture and wonderful video. Thank you for joining us. We are great, very grateful. Thank you. See you soon. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Risha. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Dr. Manisha Agarwal. She is the head of Trio Retina and Clinical Research Services at uh, Shroff's Charity Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, she did her fellowship from Shankarnetralaya, Chennai, and she has uh, many publications to her credit and she is the secretary of UVIT Society of India and joint secretary of VRSI and she has won several awards like uh, Indian Society for Prevention of Blindness and Endowment Award and uh, a lot many. Over to you madam uh, for your talk on vitrectomy in UVITs. Good evening, everyone. And at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Biswas, Dr. Gopal, and Dr. Risha for giving me this opportunity. So in the coming few minutes, I would be speaking on the role of doing a vitrectomy in patients of uveitis. So there are certain specific indications and the indications can be both either a diagnostic vitrectomy or a therapeutic vitrectomy. As far as the indications of a diagnostic vitrectomy is concerned, it can be in any situation where we are not very sure of the diagnosis and we want to confirm it. However, before plunging into any kind of an interventional vitrectomy for the purpose of diagnosis, we should have done a thorough clinical examination and all possible laboratory investigations, which have failed to draw a conclusion on the diagnosis. A strong suspicion of any intraocular malignancy like a masquerade again warrants a diagnostic vitrectomy. A potentially site-threatening acute uveitis with a negative non-invasive laboratory and ancillary investigations. And last but not the least, any atypical presentation of uveitis, which we may not be very familiar with. As far as the various indications, again, of doing a vitreous sampling in uveitis is concerned, there can be several indications, both infectious and non-infectious, but the most commonly in our clinics would be when we are suspecting an intraocular lymphoma, any masquerade, a myeloidosis, or a non-infectious uveitis. A diagnostic vitrectomy is very often planned only after we've done a detailed clinical history taking of our patient, a complete ocular and a physical examination. A relevant ancillary test have been all performed, including angiography, a B scan or a UVM, and various laboratory investigations have all been exhausted. We should have a list of differential diagnoses well in place with the list of tests which are to be performed on the test or the sample that has been collected. And also we should inform the microbiologist and pathologist to be ready to perform the test that we are looking for. Small tips for doing a vitreous sampling in certain special situations. We, we should be having an undiluted sample where we either do no infusion use or we can use an air infusion in case there is a hypotony while collecting the sample. In cases of intraocular lymphoma, it's extremely important to remember to stop oral steroids for two weeks prior to doing a sampling. The lab is informed of the sample coming we should use extremely low cut rate of the vitrectomy cutter as low as 600 cuts per minute and all vitreous sample with the fluid cassette is often sent to the lab for evaluation. 
preferably the plating is done in the operation theater. And these are the whole list of the tests which can be performed on the sample that has been collected. But of course, these are tailored according to the patient profile. I'll give you this interesting case example where a diagnostic vitrectomy really helped us to reach a diagnosis and treat this young patient. He was an 18 year old boy from Bihar with gradual painless diminution of vision in the left eye for last six months with no significant systemic or a contact history low socioeconomic status, and the vision in the left eye was as low as hand movement close to face. The right eye was normal, but the left eye showed this unusual subretinal yellowish lesion, which was abutting the macular area. There was subretinal fluid also, which was present. And this also was accompanied with a hyperemic disc, which very much suggested that we were dealing with an inflammatory pathology. When we did an OCT passing through this area, there was a gross thickening of the retinal layers and also involving the choroid to a certain extent. On doing a fundus fluorescein angiography, there were mottled areas of increased hyperfluorescence within the lesion with diffuse leakage in the late phase. Well, we did a B scan again, and this just showed a high surface reflectivity with a homogeneous low to moderate internal reflectivity. And this was really not very diagnostic of any particular diagnosis. The differential diagnosis in our mind for this young child was a subretinal abscess secondary to tuberculosis, which we thought was the most common in our clinics, and any other chronic infection like a fungal infection, and last we thought was of a lymphoproliferative disorder. On doing various investigations, everything seemed to be normal, but what was unusual was that the Mantoux was zero in this particular young patient. There was a raised ESR, which was suggestive of a chronic infection. The Mantoux zero just suggested that probably the patient was immunocompromised. We did a systemic evaluation uh, with a pediatrician and everything seemed to be normal except the child was below the regular percentile that was expected at his age. A clearance was taken to start the systemic steroids. However, everything seemed to be quite inconclusive and it was a diagnostic dilemma for us. So we went ahead and we did a diagnostic vitrectomy and in today's time with MIVS, it's extremely easy to collect a sample and this at times can also be a sutureless diagnostic vitrectomy where you collected a sample right above the lesion and the sample was then sent for various kinds of investigations in the lab. And the vitreous biopsy did show a growth on the culture plate and we did get gram positive filamentous bacilli and they finally turned out to be a diagnosis of a nocardia species. The treatment accordingly was modified and MRI brain was done to rule out the intracranial nocardiosis and the patient was started on sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim combination along with the steroids. And you see that the child did respond very well and the vision improved to 618 and 24 after a two months of therapy. We did go ahead and publish this case because it was a learning for us. But as you would realize, a diagnostic vitrectomy in this case actually clinched the diagnosis where we were absolutely lost in our clinic how to treat this young patient. So this was something important and this is again an important learning for all of us when we are lost with our patients. As far as coming to the indications of a therapeutic vitrectomy in uveitis is concerned, it can be again for various indications like for clearing out media opacification and also for clearing out the vitreous hemorrhage. There is a role of doing a vitrectomy for control of inflammation, which is very much warranted these days. We all know the role of vitrectomy again for managing patients of endophthalmitis. It can also be indicated for various structural complications, including an epithelial membrane, a VMT, a regmatogenous RD, and a chronic hypotic, and also for delivery of various intravitreal drug delivery systems. As far as clearing the media obesity is concerned, it is basically more useful in patients where we have uh, uh, uveitic entities which are complicated with neovascularization and vitreous hemorrhage, most commonly encountered in patients with past splenitis, sarcoidosis, retinal vasculitis, Bechet's disease, and SLE. And here the main surgical is to clear the media obesity, but also to treat the underlying retinal ischemia or neovascularization with ablative laser photocoagulation. Inflammatory control, again, in infective endophthalmitis, it's basically to debulk the vitreous for drugs to act, lens-induced uveitis, again, helps to control the uveitis secondary to lens fragments. And in the intermediate uveitis, it is said to be, uh, you know, helping to reduce the load of the pro-inflammatory mediators and thereby helping in controlling the inflammation.
This is an interesting patient of mine, and I would just like to share this video with all of you. Why is he not coming? Is the voice she there, underwent sir? an anterior chamber wash yes. with removal of okay. multiple linear so foreign bodies uh, and sure. was found to be stable post-operatively. She, however, had recurrent episodes of vitritis with a drop of vision which would respond to oral steroids, however, recur on stopping them. There were extensive exudates in the pars plana with peripheral tractional retinal detachment and vitritis. Ultrasound biomicroscopy showed thickened pars plana with multiple hyperreflective linear structures suggestive of query caterpillar hair. She was planned for a pars plana vitrectomy three weeks after a 360 degree laser photocoagulation. She underwent an encircling band and a lensectomy was done sparing the anterior lens capsule. PVD induction was done and the vitrectomy was completed. There were peripheral retinal detachment with posterior laser chorioretinal atrophy, which was well seen. Multiple caterpillar hair were removed from within the exudates in the past plana, leading to a few retinal breaks. This was followed by fluid air exchange and laser was done to the retinal breaks, followed by silicon oil injection. Three months later, she underwent silicon oil removal with secondary IOL implantation. Her last follow-up at two years showed a vision of 69N6, which she maintained in the left eye with no history of recurrence of inflammation. So another indication of doing a vitrectomy can be a chronic hypotony to remove all the cyclitic membranes. And this can salvage the eyes from going into thysis. Sometimes we also opt for doing a silicon oil injection in these cases when we are dealing with atrophic ciliary processes. So I would just end my talk by saying that whenever we are in doubt and not able to confirm the diagnosis or there is a poor or no response to treatment, it's better to opt for a diagnostic vitrectomy. A preoperative ancillary testing has to be put to the best use before we plan any interventional diagnostic procedure. Therapeutic vitrectomy again is warranted in certain situations of uveitis, like I showed this interesting case where their patient was having a recurrent vitritis because of the caterpillar hair, which were deeply embedded in the pars plana area. And here it helped in salvaging the eye because the patient continued having repeated episodes of inflammation. So a therapeutic vitrectomy can help in sight restoration, control of inflammation, and also at times salvaging the eyeball. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Manisha. Wonderful video, fabulous video. Thank you, sir. Please. Trisha, you are muted. Trisha, you are muted. Yes. Sorry, sir. Uh, next, our next speaker is Dr. Alayas Bankar. He is the director of Bankar's Eye Clinic, Ahmedabad. He has won several prestigious awards and he is the member of International UVITIS uh, Society Group. And he has published 48 purple papers in international and national peer reviewed journals and has written eight book chapters. He has given over 500 guest speaker presentations and over 100 instruction courses at national and international conferences. Welcome you, sir, for the first innings in the session. Thank you, Risha. And I would like to uh, thank Dr. JB and Gopal uh, for their kind invitation. 
and letting me uh, be a part of this fabulous program, which has been designed by uh, Dr. JB. Uh, I hope you can all see my slides. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. So Dr. JB has asked me to speak on COVID related and ophthalmitis. And uh, I would just like to start my talk uh, sharing a few cases that we have seen. Uh, and my one of the first cases is a 61 year old male who presented with dimness of vision uh, over a period of last one month. Uh, and he had uh, been diagnosed as COVID positive in November, 2020 and uh, was treated for about two weeks and turned negative in two weeks. Uh, and he presented with a vision of PLPR faulty in his left eye and 624 in the right eye. And if you see the presentation, the right eye, there was a vitreous haze about plus 1.5, plus two. Uh, however, the left eye was dense vitreous haze, no view of the retina. And within that vitreous haze, you can see some yellowish uh, uh, kind of a subretinal abscess like lesion uh, within the retina. And so we opted to do an, an early vitrectomy in this case, uh, suspecting this to be of endogenous endophthalmitis. And this is very peculiar in these cases. And I'm showing this step because they have a very dense anterior hyaloid and all the exudates are stuck to the hyaloid. So you have to be very, very careful in dissecting the anterior hyaloid, particularly if the patient is phacic. And you can see how gently we are trying to gauge the anterior hyaloid in the cutter port and then pulling it down towards the retina. And then you can see this subretinal abscess like lesion, which is actually protruding from the underlying retina into the vitreous cavity. And once we've cleared off the surrounding vitreous, we are able to delineate the entire subretinal abscess. And once we cleared the vitreous, we could see that there was an associated temporal retinal detachment. And in such cases, I usually like to do <clears throat> a thorough complete vitrectomy, including uh, a complete posterior hyaloid dissection and base excision. And what I'm trying to do here is trying to get some sample from within the abscess. And we take the sample and do the culture freshly inoculate in the OR. And this case turned out to be the fungal element. Uh, this is a very nice picture of the calcophore white stain. And it turned out to be the bipolaris uh, species, which uh, this is a very classical uh, sh shown here which shows pigmented uh, pseudo septi fusiform uh, bipolar SPC, which is an extremely rare uh, fungal infection occurring in the eye. Uh, and this is how the patient ended up. This was on presentation. Uh, this is post vitrectomy in an oil filled eye. And you can see we've attained a good anatomical outcome. However, the vision remains uh, very poor. This was another case, again, a similar case presenting to us as a subretinal abscess like lesion. And if you see the OCT, you can see this whole bump of the vitreous trying to protrude into the uh, vitreous cavity, the whole abscess. And on your right is the post-operative picture. Again, an oil filled eye. Uh, you can see the scarring uh, after prolonged systemic antifungal therapy. This is another type of case, again, presenting with uh, bilateral endogenous endophthalmitis. These are all COVID positive patients. The right eye showing multiple cotton ball opacities, and you can see very nice uh, destruction of the retinal layers on the OCT in the right eye. However, the left eye, fortunately, the retina was spared, but you can see these colonies in the uh, vitreous. And uh, this patient underwent a vit primary vitrectomy in the right eye, but was treated with intravitreal injections and systemic therapy in the left eye. Uh, encouraged by this, and I would like to thank and give credit to Dr. Manisha, uh, who perceived in uh, you know, combining our case series. And we've just recently published our case series in uh, uh, ocular inflammation, immunology and inflammation, and a multi-centered trial. And I would urge you all to read this paper. And she's very nicely written uh, the various aspects of endogenous endophthalmitis that we see uh, in COVID cases. Till date, there have been uh, five other publications and we'll briefly go through them. Uh, this is a very nice series of a presumed fungal endophthalmitis uh, presented by one of our co-speakers, Partho Datta Majumdar and his colleagues. And you can see these nice pictures again of a vitrectomized eye. And uh, these are very classical 
cotton ball like opacities and this is very typical of endogenous endophthalmitis that it's very difficult to get a positive culture in majority of these infections. Dr. Malika Goyal and her group also have very, very nicely described uh, uh, retinal manifestations in which she has described cases with candida, uh, with cotton ball opacities, and a very peculiar tubercular, presumed tubercular abscess like endogenous endophthalmitis, which did not grow positive in culture but responded very well to the antimicrobial therapy. Uh, in another case series by Dr. Daraj Shroff and his colleagues, a very, very nice uh, presentation of cases of uh, Paul positive fungal and ophthalmitis. And they have very nicely described the various features and has again similarly suggested uh, that early vitrectomy should be attempted in all cases of fungal and ophthalmitis. A very rare case of endogenous Clepsal and ophthalmitis has been reported in the literature, and it was following a patient who developed uh, emphysematous prostatitis, uh, having a systemic infection post-COVID uh, due to prolonged hospitalization and prolonged steroid therapy, and secondary developing septicemia leading to endogenous endophthalmitis. And one of the last case, last series Again, endogenous endophthalmitis uh, presented by Dr. Sudarkar and his group. And again, in their group also, they have mentioned uh, that it's very difficult to get the positive culture. Interestingly, uh, none of the cases reported in the literature so far, except in this paper, only one case in this paper actually uh, grew positive PCR COVID in the vitreous sample. In our series and uh, two or three of my cases also we've done but none of the vitreous sample showed any positive uh, COVID. So we are not sure whether these infections are primary COVID or secondary. So what have we learned from these cases in the COVID era? Well, immunocompetent patients with a history of recent severe COVID infection, particularly with prolonged hospitalization and treatment with steroids, they are at a high risk of developing endogenous endophthalmitis. Why does this happen? because it is thought that the COVID-19 viral infection causes a decrease in the lymphocytes, especially the CD4 counts, and predisposes the patients to opportunistic infections. Also, most of these patients have an intravenous line and have prolonged steroid therapy, making them prone to these infections. Identification of organism is difficult. Majority of these patients, the signs far exceed the symptoms and present with a very gradual visual loss. And hence, majority of the patients presented late in the course of their disease. The prognosis and outcome is generally poor. Uh, as Dr. Manisha has mentioned in a paper, the COVID-19 infection and subsequent inflammatory cytokine storm requiring treatment with high doses of steroids and even immunomodulatory drugs with systemic comorbidities, mainly diabetes, makes these patients immunocompromised, thereby reactivating many latent infections in the body and causing the endogenous endophthalmitis. So we conclude that if you see a case of endogenous endophthalmitis in a COVID era, you should have very high suspicion, start treatment very early with long-term systemic as well as multiple intravital injections, and particularly, I believe that early primary vitrectomy and even primary silicon oil in severe cases is the way to salvage these eyes. So in summary, I would say patients with COVID-19 infection, specifically with a history of hospitalization, ICU stay, prolonged systemic therapies, and comorbidities like diabetes should always be looked for endogenous endophthalmitis. Any patient with any evidence of intraocular inflammation requires a very high index of clinical suspicion and should thoroughly be investigated not only for ocular, but also for systemic causes. Prompt administration of intravitreal antimicrobial agents along with systemic antimicrobial therapy and early surgery is the key to management of acute endogenous endophthalmitis. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Olai. Very nice presentation. There is a conflicting uh, reports of the VPS specimens or aqua specimens contain the viral uh, artificial positive. There is a recent study in the American Journal of Optometry. They found about 6% cases 
um, have that RT PCR positive. Okay, I will not be presenting now. At the end, if time permits, I'll present Risha, please. Can you go ahead with the next presenter? Okay, sir. Next, I invite Dr. Mamda Agarwal, a senior consultant in UBITIS and Cornea Services, Shankarnetralia, Chennai. She did her post graduation and fellowship from Shankarnetralia and the observership from Moorfield Sai Hospital, London. She is a member of international and national societies and a reviewing editor of many journals and a reviewer of several international indexed journals. And she is the author of Atlas of Uveitis and Scleritis, published in 2005, along with many peer-reviewed articles in international and uh, international journals and book chapters. Over to you, Dr. Mamda, for her talk on scleritis, infective versus non-infective. Thanks, Risha, for uh, a very nice introduction for me, and I would like to I, I share my screen. Uh, if we can share here. Yes. At the outset, I would just like to thank Dr. Uh, Gopal and Dr. JB for having me in this wonderful program of, uh, which is the topic which is very close to my heart, scleritis. Uh, Infectious and non-infectious scleritis. One second, I'll just uh, set the screen. Yeah. So uh, scleritis and non, uh, is it always infectious or non-infectious? That's a question which always comes to our mind when we are dealing with these patients. So it can be anterior or posterior, we all know. But then is it always in non-infectious or we do deal with patients who have infectious scleritis? Is it not moving? Yeah. So in scleritis, as we all know, is the inflammation of the sclera, both anterior and posterior. And the incidence ranges between 3.4 to 4.1. It's more common in females. And most common, as we all know, is anterior, non-necrotizing and non-infectious scleritis. And more than 40% patients, they have systemic disease association, mainly rheumatoid arthritis, grand rheumatosis with polyangitis, relapsing polychondritis, and also few other infectious diseases like tuberculosis, syphilis, Hansen's, Lyme's, Zoster, and fungal scleritis. So these are the few patients where we see we need to really look at their systemic workup. They may be patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Here it's an inflamed pinna with a patient with the nodular scleritis, and then herpes zoster of thalamicus can also present with uh, scleri scleral congestion, and here's a patient with Hansen's disease who came. So the pathogenesis, as we all know, it's the infiltration of the inflammatory cells into the episclera and sclera. The mechanisms, if it's a diffuse scleritis, it's mainly non-granulomatous, but they say in granulomatous response is seen in the nodular scleritis, especially when it's a nodular necrotizing scleritis. And it's both type two, three, and type four hypersensitivity reactions. What are the basic symptoms when a patient com comes to uh, our clinic? He usually complains it's a dull pain, sometimes it's really tender and in the eye and the surrounding area. And it worsens with eye movements and it radiates to the neck, jaw, face and cheek. The eye can be red or it can have a violaceous hue when we see the external examination. There is swelling of the eye, there is scleral edema and sometimes the patient can have decreased vision when it involves cornea and retina. So what are the phenotypes? As we all see, uh, it is mostly diffuse anterior scleritis, the corkscrew vessels, deep episcleral congestion of the vessels and it does not blanch with phenylephrine drops as we see in episcleral congestion. And it can also be a nodular scleritis, which is a firm, tender nodule, which is immobile and is, uh, is well delineated on the UVM and ultrasound also can pick up these nodular elevations. But the other entity, what we know is necrotizing scleritis. Like the first slide, which uh, first patient is a patient with vaginal granulomatosis. The next one is a, again a scleral infiltrate in a patient with tuberculosis. And the next one, this is a fungal scleritis in a patient post vitrectomy who presented with one foci of scleral congestion. 
So besides scleritis, if the adjacent structures are also involved, they can have peripheral ulcerative keratitis. As we see, 360 degree whitish infiltrate involving the cornea, or if it involves the cornea, it can also have a diffuse corneal edema because of the corneal decompensation. It's the inflammation that causes all this. If it's a chronic scleritis, we can see this kind of a bulge, what we all know, that scleritis with anterior staphyloma. This patient underwent a patch graft, as we see here, before we took him up for cataract surgery. And then a chronic scleritis patient can present with this kind of a bluish sclera with complicated cataract. And we did the patient's uh, phagal mulsification with intraocular lens implantation. Again, a very challenge uh, intra because of the view of the hazy cornea. But then... These are the complications which we see in these eyes on a long-term basis. If not anterior, there is also posterior scleritis, as we see in this clinical picture. And this can present as nodular elevations in the retina. They can have choroidal folds, optic disc edema, subretinal fluid. And it can also have angle closure due to the ciliary body rotation. The ultrasound, as we all know, can have subtenons whitening. And OCT can pick up various things like sclerochoroidal thickness, it can have subretinal fluid and also the intraretinal fluid. I'd like to share an important case here. This is a patient, a young patient who comes to us with bilateral redness and these yellow spots. Looking at it, I thought it's an infectious scleritis and took the patient for scraping, but it came out negative. Started the patient on antibiotics, but at one week, what I see, the number of yellow spots, they are all increasing. So is it something which we are really missing? I took a scraping again, but again, it was negative. And at this point, thought it's a non-infectious necrotizing scleritis and treated the patient with intravenous methylprednisolone followed by oral steroids. And this is what we see, complete healing. And the patient now is on maintenance dose of anti-metabolites. So this was another case, a patient who is already known to be C-anchor positive granulomatosis polyangitis. And she just chooses to stop her medicines, methotrexate and odoprednisolone. So what do we see? It's an acute episode of necrotizing scleritis with a severe hypotony. As we see here, this is a scleroconial merit. And the patient was injected a subtenon injection locally. But what did we do? We just gave intravenous methylprednisolone and oral steroids. And we also put a synephrylate glue here with a contact lens. This is the patient at one week. And this is after three months, visual equity improves to 624. So it's very important that not every infection uh, looking uh, scleritis is an infectious scleritis. So infectious scleritis is a rare cause, but then we need to be aware of this entity, which is very important. We can see it after surgeries. We can see after trauma. Pterygium surgery is the most commonly reported surgery. And the pathogenesis of it can be an exogenous or endogenous infection. It's a direct invasion by the organism, or it can be a hypersensitivity reaction, as we see in the tuberculosis. The most commonly reported organisms are Pseudomonas and Aspergillus. So what are the different phenotypes? We need, we need to be aware of these clinical entities. Look at this elevation. Looks very similar to the nodular lesion what we saw in non-infectious. But then this turns out that it was a nocardial infection. And this one, again, it's a yellow spot under the sclera. And what we see here, this came out to be a fungus infection. It can manifest as small pus points, as we see in this patient, or it can present as ulcerations on the globe. And this patient, now these are the entities where I want to show that it can be just one foci or it can be multiple foci. Like as we see here, this was a fungal scleritis which had multiple nodules. And here this was multifocal lesions and which turned out to be nocardia. And etiology, when we all know, it can be fungus. As we see, this was a HIV-positive patient, and this was Candida albicans. And here, this was a Pseudomonas serotinosa, again, a diffuse lesion. And this is nocardia, which is known to cause multifocal lesions on the sclera. And this patient, we had herpes zoster of thalmicus, which had scleritis, uveitis, and keratitis, which can manifest in post-herpes zoster infections. So this was an interesting case I would like to share. This is a 50-year-old patient who came to us with decreased vision, pain, and redness with a history of fall of some vegetative matter. He was diagnosed to have scleritis and treated with intravenous antibiotics and steroids for last four months. But what do we see here? Look at this, intense scleral congestion with a yellow spot here. We took it for a scleral biopsy, and this was now gram-positive filamentous bacteria. Started the patient on treatment. A week later, these are just the slides showing 
gram positive filamentous bacteria and we found it this was nocardia amemiensis at one week we see there is a hypopion and these are the exudates on the cornea makes me worried was it worsening but then fungus was stable but i admitted the patient and started on intravenous antibiotics and this is the follow up of the patient as we see and now this was a two months complete healing following antibiotic treatment and he has a bizarre astigmatism but he is improving to 622 624 in this patient so it's very important that we diagnose these patients and differentiate very clearly what is an infection and what is a non infection and then treat them accordingly the treatment we know it's immune related scleritis steroid nsaids in intravenous or oral steroids but then we also need to be knowing about immunomodulators and latest is biologics which includes adalimumab rituximab infliximab but the infections we need to be very clear antimicrobials have to be started as soon as possible this is a patient i recently start treated it was a very rare infection the patient was treated for 3 months with oral steroid it was a mycobacterium abscesses and here the patient is after 7 months and this we recently published this was again a nocardia patient treated with anti tubercular and oral steroids and this is again a nocardia 7 months complete healing and this is a patient again a very challenging case in the clinic patient was given a sub conch steroid for the uh, treatment of scleritis and this was burkle daria species and here it is 7 months later complete healing so the steps of management i would say it's a very important that we have a careful history taking external examination slit lamp examination and the ancillary test can involve angiography ultrasound uvm and oct especially with posterior scleritis but blood investigations like ra ana anca hla b27 are important especially in the non infectious scleritis a complete checkup by the internist and accordingly we treat the patients but we need to know that they have to be followed very closely because we do have some cases with adverse effects with these immunosuppressive agents like this is a patient rheumatoid arthritis and on the steroids and cyclophosphamide patient comes with these conditions and this was reactivation of herpes stromal keratitis treated the patient with oral valsivir and complete healing and this is a very recent case we have seen a patient on tofacitinib jack inhibitors bilateral herpetic keratitis she is improving very well but then chronic immunosuppression or too high immunosuppression can lead to these complications and this is a patient who was on prednisolone and azathioprine again a viral stromal keratitis in the superior cornea so my take home message will be scleritis is indeed a very big diagnostic challenge it is the first manifestation of a systemic autoimmune disease in some cases a detailed history and targeted investigations are mandatory infectious scleritis is very important to know because especially with the past history of trauma surgery and chronic use of steroids because the diagnosis is often elusive and organisms they lie deep within the sclera antimicrobial should be started as soon as possible and surgical debridement often helps in these cases thank you so much for your patient hearing thank you mamta wonderful collection of cases all success story good next amrisha uh, dr mamta can you please stop sharing yes uh, next i would like to invite dr dipankar das Uh, he works at uh, Sri Shankar Deva Netralaya, Guwahati, Assam, as a senior consultant and HOD of Ocular Pathology and UVitis Services. He did his fellowship from Shank Shankar Deva Netralaya and training from Shankar Netralaya, Chennai. He is a recipient of several awards. He has over one twenty-seven peer-reviewed publications, more than two fifty-one national and international presentations. he had described a new rosset in the pathology of retinoblastoma and uh, further he has coined uh, aphrocytosis in retinoblastoma and he did his observership in inflammation uveitis and uh, ophthalmic pathology at dohini eye institute under dr narsing rao over to you sir for your talk on parasitic uveitis
My slides are visible, Risha? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, Risha. Uh, at the outset, I like to thank uh, Dr. Gopal, Professor Biswas, my mentor, for this opportunity and coaching uh, of Thelmic Club for this wonderful conference. I'll be presenting next few minutes on parasitic evades. I do not have any financial interest in any of this material presented here. Now, this is a 60-year-old gentleman with a dancing one in the anterior chamber. Now, this uh, patient was immediately taken to OT and uh, at three o'clock, parasynthesis was done uh, with a, a methylcellular delivery of this one was made and it was sent to the laboratory in a, 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 a normal cell line. And you can well appreciate the worm was live here. And what it did is that uh, uh, took the worm in a petri and under the objective of microscope, we examined the worm. And you can well appreciate every structure, internal structure of this worm are visible. Now, this is very important uh, to know, uh, like a wet mount preparation, the various uh, uh, structure of worm can be uh, seen and they, uh, can be reported to the surgeon that we are dealing with uh, this sort of worm. Now, this patient, was diagnosed in wet mount preparation as a dilophilaria, and we have published this case as a rare case of anterior chamber dilophilariasis. Now, post operatively, the patient improved the vision and was doing well. Now, the second case is a very interesting case of a nethostoma uh, in the vitreous and the retina with retinal hemorrhage. The patient was a nurse by profession and, and was uh, in the habit of taking a, a smoked fish uh, in a diet. Now, this animation you can see uh, three ports parts uh, uh, vitrectomy was done. The core vitrectomy uh, uh, was done to uh, remove the uh, hemorrhages that was there in front of the one. Now, uh, after the core vitrectomy, uh, a fruit needle was introduced to remove the worm uh, from the uh, vitreous and the retina component. Now, you observe the uh, in, uh, in three port parts of vitrectomy, why uh, the uh, surgery was done in 2007 by uh, our uh, professor, Dr. Harsha Bhattacharji. And this is the core vitrectomy which was being carried out, uh, removing the uh, superficial vitreous hemorrhages. Now, uh, the worm is. Uh, well visualized uh, near the optic disc. Now the part of the worm was within the pseudo capsule. Uh, you can well see uh, 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 the, uh, the retinal hemorrhage, uh, etc., are being cleared by vitrectomy proof. And see this one uh, is partly in the pseudo capsule and when being disturbed, it is making a, a movement there. And uh, subsequently this one made a, uh, 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 because it was uh, disturbed, it made a uh, retinotomy and uh, it entered behind the retina. Now, this is a very real time and very challenging for the surgeon to bring the one uh, out meticulously and see the, this worm is uh, making a, a hole in the retina and uh, the surgeon, uh, is engaged now to remove the one. The caudal portion is being seen now, and you see the uh, surgeon is dissecting with, uh, with the uh, instrument to bring the one out. It's a very difficult task, okay? And Part of the capsule is being removed. And now the worm is just sucked in with a fruit needle. 
and it was retrieved live. Now, post-operatively, the patient, the, all the hemorrhages uh, were removed, vision improved to 6-6 in this patient. Now, you can well appreciate the head bulb portion where four transverse rows of hooklets were seen and the body as well as caudal portion uh, did the diagnosis of nephrostoma spinegeria. Professor Narsing Rao uh, did uh, uh, scanning electron microscope for us and we have published in the retina as a full length article. Now, this is a worm I wanted to show you is the subconjunctival portion, along with there was some evades in the present, both they can be independent of each other. Now, this worm was again brought light, and this was a dirophagidia worm, uh, which, was, uh, which was a telesia worm, and which was uh, diagnosed uh, in scanning electron microscopy. Now, uh, two cases of telesia we have published uh, from our institute, one with the gravid uterus a uh, few years back. Now, again, this is a, another one uh, making a, a retinal hole. Now, this was uh, brought live and you just see the one under the compound microscope objective and you can even now diagnose whatever thing I have told to you. These are the internal structures. And now you pay attention to the head portion of the one, which has four hooklets, four hooklets, and this was uh, consistent with a nethostoma spinegerium. So immediately within five, we have reported the surgeon that we are dealing with a nethostoma spinegerium. These are the wet mount preparation. These are some wet mount preparation, and this is in high power objective, the spines and the uh, 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 lateral portion of the warmer acute. Now, cystic sarcos, as uh, uh, Risha showed, one anterior segment cystic sarcosis. These are all posterior segment cystic sarcosis. This can ultrasound is essential to localize the cyst and the scolex. And this is one of the uh, cysts with the scolex that was dissected out. Now, uh, this is one of our publication of a neuro and intraocular cystic sarcosis clinical pathology case report. Sometimes you get this sort of invigilation in the um, vitreous cavity of cystic sarcus lesion. Now, here is an important clinical uh, clue for this pathological sample. If there is a intraocular cystic sarcosis, and if you put a patient with anti helminth medication, immediately there may be a uh, one may be killed and there may be endophthalmitis like picture. So, ideally, in those situations, you have to remove the worm, uh, then you treat the cases. That's very important from this pathological uh, case. Now, the neurocystic sarcosis, these are the, some quaint shaped lesion, ocular cystis, ocular cystis sarcosis should have an imaging of the CNS, which is very, very important. Toxoplasmosis, which is the most important part of a uh, posterior vitreous, and this case was a headlighting for appearance of classical toxoplasma lesion, and there may be a congenital toxoplasma, which are mostly located at the posterior pole. Um, in right hand side picture, there are multifocal uh, toxoplasma lesion. If it's a bilateral, only suspect HIV infection. In our series, uh, for 12 years, we have seen 93 cases of toxoplasmosis, which is 76 congenital cases, where 52 were healed and 24 are active. Now, toxocariasis, which can present with uh, peripheral granuloma, as Dr. Natasha also shown in our cases. Uh, now here, you can have a peripheral granuloma or a central granuloma. Sometimes they can have a uh, endophthalmitis picture. Here, histories of puppies uh, is important and can present with glucocoria. With oral steroid, they can have a heat resolution. Now, one important thing is that uh, sometimes filarial one, well, there is something called ulbechia. Ulbechia means this one have a propensity to develop a, a microorganisms, particularly bacterial uh, 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 bacteria within the periphery of this one. Now, if you put this antibacterial medication, which uh, prevents the or inhibits the mitochondrial uh, uh, change in the um, uh, uh, ovary of this uh, female, uh, then it kills the one and it has a applied importance. Now, Ratinam et al. had wonderfully demonstrated inocular inflammation and infection channel that various methodologies of uh, 
uh, right from the sleep lamp, uh, indirect, direct examination with a allied uh, investigation. We have a direct life examination of parasite under the microscope. Now, from South India, uh, uh, infection by retinum at all. Um, uh, Professor Biswas uh, had a um, significant contribution in parasitic VIT. Sir, one and more. From, yeah, yeah, I'm finishing. And from Kerala, uh, uh, Angamali, uh, where Risha belongs, I think, from um, uh, Tony Fern late Tony Fernandez, we have a lot of diarophilia. One in North India, we have seen toxoplasmosis, other parasitic infection. And from our part, we have seen toxoplasmosis and other uh, infection. In all the pattern of evades that you have seen from Northeast India, we have seen 43 cases of toxoplasmosis. In posterior evades, toxoplasmosis was the highest, followed by toxocara. I saw this case in uh, anterior evades and uh, pen evades. So, uh, all these cases, toxoplasmosis was the highest, followed by toxocariasis, cystic followed by cystic sarcosis, few cases of diarophilia. Telesia nephrostoma and diffuse ureter subacute neuroretinitis. Uh, comparing the studies, we well, our present studies for 12 years, 161 cases we have seen uh, with uh, toxoplasmosis being highest. Toxocariasis we have seen significant number followed by cystic sarcosis and two cases of. These are the publication uh, showing the uh, pathology of ocular parasitic disease. Now this live worm examination has come to the textbook. We are grateful uh, that people have recognized this. So in conclusion, parasitic disease causing evades are not that rare. Early diagnosis and management and awareness of parasitic evades is a must. Live imaging of extracted parasite helps in rapid diagnosis and prompt treatment of the patient. I like to acknowledge Professor Soyul Islam who is teaching. Today it's also he has taught me some uh, parasitic worm from the animal uh, uh, life Professor Narsing Rao, uh, my uh, uh, head, Dr. Harshabhattacharya, my mentor, Professor Biswas, Ratina Madam, Dr. Saiten, Kalyan, Amrata, and Okurbo. Thank you for patient here. Thank you. Thank you, Dipankar. You should have heard a lot of claps if it was a physical meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, can you uh, stop sharing? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Patma Malini Mahendradas. Uh, she heads the UBITIS and Ocular Immunology Services at Narayan Netralaya, Bangalore. She is a member of International UBIT Study Group and an International Ocular Inflammation Society and treasurer of uh, Society of Inflammation and Research executive and scientific committee member of UBIT Society of India. She has around 100 indexed publications, 24 non-indexed publications, 38 book chapters, and 11 awards to her credit. Over to you, Madam, on a talk on imaging in posterior UBITs. Thank you, Doctor. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Risha. Good evening to all of you. At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Gopal Pillai, Professor Biswas, and Cochin of Talmic Club for inviting me here today to speak on imaging in posterior uveitis. The next 10 minutes also, I'll be talking to you various imaging modalities ranging from B-scan ultrasonographic to adaptive optics in IA. For the benefit of the postgraduates, I request them to read this article on multimodal imaging of the normal eye, as we need to know how the normal eye looks to understand the various patho pathological conditions. The next, recently we have published an article, review article on ocular imaging in the diagnosis and determining the response to therapeutic interventions in posterior pan uveitis. This article covers most of the UVIT entities of posterior uveitis. The B scan is useful to assess the posterior segment whenever the media is very hazy. We are not able to visualize as we see in this case for complicated cataract. We assess the corridor thickness. It is as, uh, 
assessed near the peripapillary region and used to monitor the response to treatment. Posterior steroiditis is diagnosed based on the B scan ultrasonography by the presence of subtenans fluid. T sign can be present in some set of patients. Coming to the multimodal imaging, where we have combination of multicolor imaging, red free imaging to pick up the nerve fiber layer defect and fundus autofluorescence to study the RPE and choreocapillary pathology diseases. Fundus fluorescent angiography, what we call it as FFA, is used to study the retinal vasculature. Indocyanin green angiography or the ICG is used to study the choroidal vas vessels. Optical coconut tomography is used to get the in vivo histopathology of the retina. And OCTA, that is optical coherence tomographic angiography, is used to study the retinal vessels. In this, especially it is useful in studying the coronal neovascular membranes in eviatic entities. Coming to the fundus photography, the classical 55 degree fundus photography is used to document the posterior segment pathologies. The same thing, we can attach the montage to study the frosted bands angiitis with the classical CMB retinitis, what we call it as a pizza pie appearance. Optos image up to 200 degrees is a white field photography. Here is a classical case of a post fever retinitis, secondary to dengue infection, has multifocal retinitis. The OCT shows hyperreflectivity with the after shadowing effect. Multicolor imaging shows the yellowish white retinitis lesions. In addition to that, we can see the greenish hue corresponding to the areas of intraretinal fluid with ILM folds. Here again, blue reflectance and green reflectance, the retinitis lesions are better appreciated compared to the infrared one. The same patient with the serial multicolor as well as the OCT shows the stratification of the retinal layers is lost. This is at four weeks. We could see the resolving retinitis with yellowish white R exudates appearing in the macula and slowly the stratification started appearing on the retina. This we recently published in International Ophthalmology Journal as a role of multicolor imaging in post fever retinitis. 30-year male presented with decrease in vision, clinically diagnosed of a multifocal subregenoid choroiditis with the white field we are able to assess. And in this particular patient, in addition to the active choroiditis, also have scars along the vessels points towards tuberculous etiology on investigations found to have tuberculosis. OCT shows hyperreflective material in the outer retina along with hyperreflective dots in the inner aspect of the choroids with increased choroidal thickness. Here you could see that this ELM is distorted with the disruption of the myoid and ellipsoid zone with RPE hypertrophy is seen in active SLC case. Autofluorescence is useful in monitoring the response to treatment. Here, of the right eye shows hypo surrounded by hyperautofluorescence at this type of an active age. During the healing phase, we could see the gradual reduction in the hyperautofluorescence and increasing in the hypoautofluorescence. When it is healed, you could see hypoautofluorescence. This is the way in which we monitor the response to treatment. This is the right eye of the patient and this is the left eye of the patient showing the same thing, where the hyperautofluorescence is turned into hypoautofluorescence at the healing stage. In addition to the ATT systemic steroids and also was put on immunosuppressant, subsequently the lesions are healed well and we are able to maintain the visual acuity of six and six in this patient. The next comes fluorescent angiography. It's your standard in studying the retinal vasculitis, most sensitive in estimating the extent of vasculitis. And also we can pick up the associated complications like neovascularizations and exactly we can map out the area of non-perfusion. It will help us to guide the Selective laser photocoagulations in retinal vasculitis cases. FFA findings are more extensive compared to what we see clinically in these cases. The next comes the dual angiography where we do a combined FFA and ICG. Here is a case of a VKH shows disc hyperfluorescence, multiple pinpoint hyperfluorescence with pooling of the dye. Whereas ICG shows more extensive involvement compared to FFA with multiple hyperfluorescent dark darts suggestive of a small choroiditis. Here again, you can see the coronal folds with SRF and intraretinal septae with the fluid in a case of an acute BKH. Next is a case of a diabetic. You came with the history of fever, where you can see multiple foci of retinitis, vasculitis, and retinal hemorrhages. FFA shows multiple hyperfluorescent dots 
Along with that, you could see multiple NVE, NVD, and extensive CNP areas are seen. The zoom up image shows multiple hyperfluorescent dots along the vessels. We call it a sting of beads appearance. This is a case of a CML. Here again, the OCT shows hyperreflective materials filling the lumen. So this could be a clinical clue or biomarker to diagnose leukemic associated proliferative vitreoretinopathy. The next OCT, we can see various appearances. Here is a case of a ARN where we can see the retinal opacification. This is a junction with the normal retina. In progressive outer retinal necrosis, we could see the necrosis of the outer retina with the swelling of the inner retinal layers. In CMD retinitis, it's a full thickness involvement with retinal opacification with cavernous like spaces with hyperreflective dots. Epidemic of post retinitis, we could see the hyperreflectivity with the aftershadowing effect with the SRF. In ocular toxoplasmosis, we could see the full thickness involvement of the retina along with the choroid, so retinochoroiditis. Next is a case of a posterior uveitis secondary to sarcoidosis, where we could see the hyperemia of the disc. Here, the OCT shows bulging of the choroid with hyperreflective spaces with hyperreflective dots. This is corresponding to the enlargement of the satellite layer. And following treatment, we could see the reduction in the choroidal thickness in this case. Next case is a 38-year male presented to us recently with hypopigmented lesions with a serous elevation in the posterior pore of the eye. Multicolor shows the greenish hue corresponding to the entire retinal fluid. Autofluorescence shows extensive areas of hyperautofluorescence. ICG shows hypofluorescent spots with localized areas of hyperfluorescence in the posterior pore. OCT shows, here again, you could see the choroidal bulge with SRF and intraretinal cystic spaces with hyperreflective material in the outer retina. This particular patient's again diagnosed her with tuberculosis was put on ATD and systemic steroids. This is a follow up three months. We could see the result choroiditis. Next is a case of a unilateral acute idiopathic maculopathy. Here we could see the serous elevation. FFA shows early hypo with late hyperfluorescence. This is the OCT appearance. The classically, the bacillary layer detachment have been described in various posterior uveitic entities like VKH, subigenous like choroiditis. Here we have described bacillary layer detachment in a case of a unilateral acute idiopathic maculopathy, where you could see the separation of the myoid zone from the ellipsoid zone. This helps us to differentiate this inflammatory conditions from non-inflammatory condition causing serous detachment in the eye. A 23-year-old female presented with bilateral pan uveitis with peripapillary CNVM, where we could see the breaks in the Brooks membrane with hyperreflective material in the outer retina. Here again, with the PEDs there, along with the intraretinal cystic spaces. This is a multimodal imaging. FFA shows staining of the CNVM, whereas ICG shows more extensive involvement of the choroid with multiple hypofluorescent hyper, spots. OCTA showing the presence of peripapillary CNVM. One Left minute more, ma'am. Similar findings. Serial OCTA helps us to monitor the response to treatment in a case of a peripapillary CNVM where we can see the spacing between the vessels are gradually decreasing the both small as well as the larger vessels. Next, here is a patient who has been treated for posterior uveitis, ill-defined yellowish lesions, looks like lymphoma. Autofluorescence shows mottled hypo with hyperautofluorescence. Confocal microscopy showed floral pattern of keratic precipitates. The sub-RPE deposits is imaging biomarker for the diagnosis of intraocular lymphoma. The vertical hyperreflective lines, the sub-RPE de deposits gives us a clue. It's a case of a lymphoma. Next is a case of a 59-year-old female. It's a granulomatosis polyangiitis with sheathing of the retinal arteriole. FFA shows staining and leakage both from the vessels and also from the disc. Adaptive optics helps us to map out the area of the sheathing. It's a parallel sheathing. This is before treatment. Following treatment, we could see the disappearance of the sheathing. This we have published in Ocular Immunology and Inflammation. The next, we are in the midst of pandemic due to COVID-19 infection. Here is a case of a post fever retinitis with retinal vascular occlusion following SARS-CoV-2 infection. Initially, the patient presented as retinitis. Following treatment with the doxy and systemic steroids by the primary ophthalmologist, the patient showed worsening of inflammation with occurrence of vascular occlusions 
At this point, the patient was referred to us where patient on examination had erythema multiforme skin lesions, hyperreflectivity with after shadowing effect, and autofluorescence shows presence of hypo with hyperautofluorescence. FFA and ICG shows block fluorescence corresponding to the areas of the retinitis and also occlusion of the vessels. So clinically, on evaluation, this particular patient showed antibodies to multiple infections, but however, at the final follow-up, only the persistence of SARS-CoV-2 was present, whereas the recipients of the other antibodies and ACTAP revealed negative for SARS-CoV-2 virus. Following treatment with doxycycline, systemic steroids, and this particular patient in view of increased D-dimer, she received subcutaneous enaxoparin, following which we could see the resolving retinitis and the vascular occlusion in this case. This case was recently be published in Ocular Immunology and Inflammation as a bilateral positive retinitis with retinal vascular occlusions following severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus infection. To conclude, multimodal imaging can help not only in making the diagnosis and also documenting following patients in various uveitic entities. Depending upon the involvement, we assess and order the investigations appropriately. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Padma. There's a wonderful contribution. We'll move to the uh, next speaker. Bala is there. Yes, next I invite Dr. Bala Murugan for his talk on uh, uh, syphilitic uveitis, a great masquerade. Dr. Ma Bala Murugan did his uh, fellowship in uveitis from uh, Aravind Eye Hospital, Madurai, and currently is working as a consultant in uh, Pondicherry branch of Aravind Eye Hospital. He has several academic publications in, with his name and has participated in several international trials of uh, practical significance. He is currently working as a editor of the newsletter of UVIT Society of India. He is also an active reviewer of several regional, national, and international journals in the field of UVITIS. Over to you, Dr. Balamurde. Well, a full screen. Yes. Bala, are you muted? Can you unmute it? you can talk you can talk yeah please and please make it full screen yes yes bala can you speak It looks as though he is not connected. It is showing that he is connected, but somehow we are not able to hear him. Can you increase the volume on your computer, Bala? Can you increase the volume of the speaker? Uh, good evening. Am I audible now? Yes, yes very yes, much. Yes. Very much. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Can you make it full screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Gopal sir and Dr. JB sir, Dr. Risha and Cochin Ophthalmic Society to present this challenging case of syphilis which I encountered recently. So this I will start with the case presentation. This was a 28-year-old gentleman who presented with right eye redness with sudden onset of painful defectivation of one week. He had a relevant history of chicken pox at the age of five years. Uh, the other uh, histories were not very significant. On general examination, he was moderately built and uh, no significant signs on the vitals. But the general examination showed some uh, sort of uh, hyperpigmented patches in the palms. 
and uh, which was curious to me and the vitals were normal uh, the uh, he actually went to another hospital where he was started with oral steroids and antibiotics and cycloplegics and he was also given a periocular injection with the diagnosis written as intermediate uveitis but he, although there is a reduction in the symptoms his defective vision persisted and that's why he consulted and on examination his vision was 6 by 60 otherwise was normal and there was some congestion cells was there with cyanic and with 3 plus vitreitis uh, we could see some fluffy lesion of 3 disc diopters in the superior temporal quadrant and few sclerosis vessel and snowball like clumping uh, the fundus photo could not be clearly made out with the dense vitreitis the oct however was able to pick up Uh, some inflammatory deposits at the VR interface. Uh, the uh, findings shown there. So we had a working diagnosis of panuveitis and kept the differentials as ARN, toxo, tuberculosis, and syphilis. So uh, we did the workup correspondingly. The TB test was negative. However, uh, the other tests were uh, reports are still pending. And we started the patient on antivirals with anti-toxo treatment with the topical treatment continued. after 3 uh, days he again had a worsening of the defective vision and the vision became 5 by 60 uh, so his reports were out and uh, we were uh, able to see the tph trypanosoma pallidum hemagglutination test being positive so uh, we were thinking uh, did we miss the sexual transmitted history on repeated probing he admitted to the uh, exposure history so uh, what really happened was there was a scarring on the palms and soles and the history was relevant we did the vdr and ftbs were positive there was dense vitreitis with a fluffy lesion and a granular mottling so uh, we still had uh, hiv with syphilis or hiv with toxoplasma or are we dealing with arn in hiv so uh, the toxo test uh, came out to be negative and with that Uh, we started uh, treating the patient with uh, uh, penicillin for the syphilis after one week uh, the media cleared so well and uh, the sheathing of the vessel was noted and uh, the vision surprisingly became 6 by 6 which was very dramatic to us so uh, this uh, uh, made us uh, that think that we need to be very careful in ruling out syphilis so it is often said that he who knows syphilis knows medicine which was uh, said none other than william ostler so being uh, it was actually called as french disease uh, coincidentally from uh, pondicherry related to france and you know that the term was first used by the italian physician and poet uh, uh, Fra- fracastaro and uh, the name was coined by them so we all know that it is a spiral gram negative bacilli it can't survive in the outside environment it can't be cultured as well so we uh, need to revisit the basic that we can have a congenital presentation early and late and acquired early and late the early could be primary secondary or early latent the late syphilis could be a neurological or a cardiovascular or a gummatous or a, again late latent type is still there so the ocular manifestation of syphilis can be uh, uh, revisited as primary syphilis secondary and tertiary syphilis the primary syphilis we have an eye chancre like congenital uh, conjunctival chancre or orbit and eyelid involvement uh, with eyelid rash periostitis dacrocystitis etc the secondary syphilis could range from anterior segment to posterior segment and the neuroophthalmic involvement so the anterior segment could present as conjunctivitis or interstitial keratitis episcleritis and scleritis and anterior non granulomatous or granulomatous uveitis the posterior segment can have a chorioretinitis or a neuroretinitis presentation the uh, uh, retinal vasculitis is well known but uh, we need to also keep an eye on the neuroophthalmic involvement in the secondary stage the tertiary syphilis as predominantly a neuropathal involvement with arp agrel robertson pupil horner syndrome tonic pupil optic atrophy cranial nerve palsies nystagmus and the field defects and uh, the eye involvement is uh, uh, considered mostly as a tertiary involvement although the secondary stage still has some chorioretinitis so the uh, ocular syphilis is uh, documented by the review article by 
Jan uh, Davis is rarely necrotizing. So that is the uh, unique selling point of this case, which where we had a necrotizing involvement of the retina. So the syphilis becomes necrotizing variant only if it is pre-treated with intraocular or periocular steroids. So this is on another case report where they said that it, the diagnosis of syphilitic retinitis is challenging and because it resembles many other virus etiologies. The beauty of syphilis, like in our case, is it responds beautifully if we in, uh, intervene at the correct point of time and the loss of vision is reversible like we regain of vision of 6 by 6 in our case. The syphilitic retinitis in homosexual men with concurrent HIV uh, is little different because in a non-HIV patient, you can have as a uh, pan uveitis whereas here you can have a post uveitis type of presentation. So uh, the uh, prevalence of syphilis has decreased. This was published by uh, Dr. Biswasar and the 70% of patients with ocular syphilis are found to be positive. The take home message is once you detect a, a TPG or VDR to be positive, it's always wiser to do a concurrent testing for the HIV status. Otherwise the treatment modality uh, might change because we need to also think about treating with antiretroviral treatment. So uh, this is another case report where uh, this, there is a, a simulation with ARN and there are uh, unilateral prochoid retinitis and uh, it resembled an ARN and uh, the appropriate workup yielded the diagnosis. So as I said that the posterior prochoid retinitis is well recognized. Whereas this uh, necrotizing retinitis is under-recognized and we need to be really careful not to mistreat it other uh, necrotizing retinitis. So diagnosis of syphilis, uh, we have a specific test, triponymal test and non-triponymal test and direct detection is rarely possible. So uh, the triponymal test, we have a TPHA, fluorescent triponymal, antibody absorption, western blot and enzyme immunoassay, whereas the non-triponymal, VDRL and RPR are there. The current guideline says we need to do both the triponymal as well as a non-triponymal test. So the traditional approach started initially with non-triponymal and then going on for a triponymal test. Whereas this reverse way of diagnosing uh, uh, promulgated by uh, CDC guidelines is it starts with the triponymal uh, and then proceeds with the non-triponymal test. So the, this is what uh, the guideline says uh, as a reverse sequencing. Based on that, we can uh, come to a reasonable consensus whether syphilis is likely or unlikely. Coming to our case per, uh, per se, what went wrong in our case? So because the treating physician uh, applied properly the Kaplan's algorithm for intermediate uveitis. It states that step one as posterior subtenon, step two is cryotherapy, step three PPV, step four immunosuppression. The, pay, the referral doctor did PST as per the guidelines and started steroids with the uh, Foster's modification of Kaplan between step one and two with adding systemic steroids. Uh, but uh, the, the limitation in our case was we, the patient was not willing for CSF and PCR. Obviously, when the vision became 6-6, six, six, you will not be uh, willing to do all those tests. So what is the current guidelines of intermediate UVA-TES is uh, we need to keep an eye that it states that step one is oral and periocular steroids, step two is the immunosuppressive, step three is a biological, step four go for PPV and uh, step five uh, is the lasers. So the treatment of syphilis uh, in the intensive phase, we have different uh, regime available, aqueous crystalline penicillin, eight hourly for 10 to 14 days, procaine penicillin, probenazid is also being recommended. And uh, of late, uh, this benzathine penicillin for three weeks is also promulgated again by the CDC because earlier people did not believe that benzathine penicillin achieved the minimum inhibitory concentration in the vitreous to have an effective action for the syphilis. Why this case? Uh, this is to present that uh, although there are several uh, guidelines for intermediate UVATs suggesting to go for local steroids, we need to be very careful because IVTA can cause peripheral retinitis if the patient happens to be syphilis and if you do not test for syphilis. Sir, one more. Uh, enough, yes, sir. This is my last slide. Co-infection of syphilis with HIV is on the rise. This emphasizes that syphilitic UVATs can present as an undetected HIV as well. And as usual, ophthalmologist was the first person to detect both syphilis and HIV. We need to have a high degree of suspicion to arrive at the correct diagnosis. So uh, take home message, specific etiology matters most. 
right? Don't treat only with steroids. We need to focus our attention on the specific etiology and any differential of UVA test. Uh, of late, we started doing both tests for tuberculosis as well as syphilis because uh, in our part of uh, uh, the working environment, uh, there is high uh, risk of both HIV and syphilis. Blindly following the protocol of intermediate UVA test should be uh, brought with caution and always think before you prick any eye. Thank you so much. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bala. Dr. Gopal. Dr. Risha or Dr. Gopal. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, sir. I think you should uh, go for your talk, sir. Uh, we I will finish by five. Go. Is there yeah. a yes, time sir. for Yes, sir. Yes, yes. sir. No. I we cannot go. miss your talk, sir, in this session. Okay. We cannot. We cannot afford to do that. You please go uh, with your talk, sir. Uh, can you stop sharing, Bala? Yeah. Bala yes, sir. Please. I'll just stop. Yeah. Yeah. So I was so amazed and uh, why that presentation by my junior colleagues. So I just didn't feel like uh, presenting. <laughs> no, I just showed you a few cases. Uh, so what is the cause is often a challenge. And I feel like the people don't ask me that what are my student or the patient, what is the cause? Because it's so difficult for many of the times. You can say that no matter what causes it, I'll treat with steroids. That's not true. I will give some example where you can't find out the cause. So this is a, let us look in some cases. This is a 30 year old man, pain, redness, photophobia. What he should do as the Risha told, history. Is it a first episode? Is there recurrence? How is the previous response to treatment? Is there low backache? Is there oral or dental ulcer? If the history of the low backache recurrence will go for one test, that's actually a bit of different. I don't do any other test. I don't do syphilis or any other test. So this is a case of 30 year old man, not much pain, not much redness, mutton fat KPs are there. Here you need to keep differential diagnosis of TB and sarcoid first in our country. So I do monthly 24 and TB gold test, both the HSCT chest and serum angiotensin converting India. All this negative, then I go in receive test, like taking a fluid from the eye and do PCR for MTV, both nested and real time. Here is the MBB64 is positive. This is a patient, this has been told, 59 year old man at chronic uveitis. And the tip, eye pressure was very high. When you see high pressure with pigmented KT, which distributed all over the cornea, you should think of uh, viral uveitis. And on the way, viral culture is not very, very possible in the virus. I'll, is that uh, we do the ACTAP for PCR. Culture is not practical. ACTAP for PCR for HSV, HSV2, uh, VJB, and CMB, both nested and real time. And here, real time PCR showed viral copies. Uh, and this patient was indeed an HSV1 positive viral anterior UVA. But there's a 20 year old man, no pain, redness, and that fine KP spirit all over the cornea. So, all over the posterior surface of the cornea. Here, you don't need to do any test. No need to investigate. This is a fuse. This is a 25 year old female, blurring of vision and floaters. And you can see the focusing the, behind the lens. You can see the various debris and strands. And we should look carefully for that exudates in the pastoral region. This is intermediate UVITS. And what I do in our country is that not multiple sclerosis is that common. We should do that TV and sarcoid, Mantu, Quantiferon, Ceramacy, and HSCT chest. Chest x is not good enough. And here is HSCT chest is uh, showing that the amazingly parenchymal involvement with the miliary nodules. And but here is the case where is uh, intermediate uveitis, where is due to sarcoid, hilar lymphadenopathy, very characteristic is seen. Now a case of posterior uveitis, this is a 66 year old man, dimness of vision, this is 618 and 18, and you can see the choroidal nodule, three choroidal nodules. You, here's the differential diagnosis is very, very important, TB sarcoid, and he's a 60 year old man, 
metastasis is important. How do you go about it? Here you should do that TV, one to 24 on HSV chest, sarcoid ceramacy, though it's not the very good marker. If all negative, do a pet CT scan because your duty to rule out the metastasis, which might be a very serious prognosis. Routine blood is normal. ESR was raised. Ceramacy was 81. And as your Dr. Partho was talking about the Mantu negative, that can give clue that it could be sarcoid. And this patient was treated with overall prednisolone, and you can see the significant resolution over the period of time. And there is after three months, lesion 6 6, lesion platin, and atrophy. This is here is another nodule in the choroid. And you can think that TB, sarcoid, both should be thought of. And this patient is uh, HSCT, HSEC, Mantu, Quantifrant TB, Gold Test, Serum C. And the physician's evaluation is quite important. And what they found the simple x ray test de detected Miller TB. And physicians found tubercular lymphadenopathy, biopsy was done, and it showed necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. Coming to the very quickly, multifocal choroiditis. Here, the differential diagnosis APMPP, multifocal sarcogenoid choroiditis, sarcoid, and lastly, syphilis, which can produce plaquoid retinopathy. This is a multifocal sarcogenoid choroiditis by Dr. Uh, Amud Gupta and PGI group has immensely contributed, and this is now thought to be of tubercular origin. And I treat with that patient with antitubercular treatment, do the extra chest, uh, CT, by, I do the HSCT chest, Mantu, Quantiferon, Serum AC, VDL, TPH, if all are negative, I do that. And this is the case of retinitis as uh, told by Dipankar, and this is a parasite, uh, this is a, one of the parasitic uveitis, which is very common. And you can see the localized vitreous says whitish fat, not the yellowish, ill defined margin associated retinal edema, overlying localized vitreous cell. And this you should think of toxoplasma almost, retinitis means almost always infective, except for basic disease. And with the localized vitreous says think toxoplasma first. And you can start the treatment if your diagnosis, you are very confirmed about it. Uh, ELISA for the test to confirm the diagnosis, not really diagnostic. And in case of HIV or atypical cases, strong suspicion, you should do the PCR of intraocular fluid if the facility is available. This is a case of HIV positive and necrotizing retinitis. And this doesn't look like toxoplasma apparently, but it was a diffuse retinitis due to toxoplasma on vitreous uh, biopsy PCR. Serum ELISA is negative to PCR for toxoplasma and intraocular fluid. This is a 34 year old man. Here you can diagnose clinically, but what kind of virus is there that for which you should do that? This is a case of ARN, but type of the virus you need to differentiate whether it's a CMB or HSV, VJV, you should do the PCR testing. And then uh, with the intravenous gancyclovir, uh, intravenous acyclovir, and uh, intervitreal gancyclovid, the lesions resolve with the restoration of the vision. And here is the case where is that vitritis is there and it doesn't fit with any diagnosis. And here in this situation, as Vala has told, you should do a think of syphilis. You should do the test for syphilis, both treponomal and non-treponomal. And here is the VDRL was positive, PTH was positive, just clinching the diagnosis of syphilis. Now, case of retinal vasculitis, here you should think of TB, sarcoid, ma firstly, and if it's negative, you should do that uh, AB and, and syphilis. This patient want to positive QTB gold positive HSCT test, so we treated the ATP and steroid, and it showed the good response to the treatment. And here is the typical candle wax dripping, and here is do the HSCT test, which showed that Hyla lymphadenopathy, serum AC was elevated. But here is the case, here is also a retinal vasculitis. Don't think it is disease. There is a retinal exhibits were right there. And this patient gave the diagnosis by looking at the face, bilateral symmetrical malar rash. It was a case of SLE. You should do an angiogram for sure. This anti DS DNA was positive on immunofluorescence. Lastly, the 20 year old man, history of fever. This is a post fever retinitis. Padmavalini has done extensive work on it. 
issued to the serology dengue, rickettsia, typhoid, chikungunya. PCR for chikungunya is done, and this case was found to be a typhoid retinitis. No specific treatment, treatment of underlying disease, give oral prednisolone. Last but not the least, don't miss it. If you see a hypopia in the young boy, girl or boy, young patient, you should think about the muscular syndrome as has been told over there. And here is the invasive case like anti-chamber tap showed basophilic cohesive cells suggestive of retinoblastoma. This is a muscular syndrome. Muscular syndrome can be diagnosed like this is a PBRL for primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. You can see the leopard skin like appearance. But here the clinical diagnosis is not enough that oncologist will not treat on the clinical basis only. So what you need a tissue diagnosis. This was a primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. We did a vitreous biopsy which showed lymphoma cells, cell block confirmed the diagnosis. So MRI brain normal, page city is no metastasis. Last case is a case of I shown to you. Here vitreous biopsy was negative, but fine little aspiration biopsy showed lymphoma cells in necrotic background. Lymphoma cells are very fragile. So you should send the vitreous biopsy specimen immediately. So MRI showed CNS lymphoma literally. So UVA is a later period. UVA is an extreme of age, think of muscular. So in summary, the take a good UVA oriented history as Risha has told, look at the patient as a whole, which also been highlighted by Risha, identify anatomic location and extent of the UVA, make a short differential diagnosis and investigate, choose wisely the investigation, stepwise approach, and lastly, investigate procedure biopsy. I'm proud of you, all the speakers. Actually, this is my junior colleagues has really wonderful job. It's of international standard, the uh, speakers which have presented today. I'm so proud of all the uh, presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gopal, for giving me the opportunity. I hope we are in time. Thank you very much, sir. It was just a treat to watch all your wonderful cases. Uh, and as you said, you have, and some of the you know, doyens of UVITIS in this country have mentored the next generation really well. And that is why you are proud of your own, uh, you know, people who are taking up the next generation of UVITIS. And I would just like to say that, you know, UVITIS is a specialty where you need to put the intelligence, you need to put uh, your experience and your, you know, very uh, astute skill of observation and put them all together to come to a diagnosis. Unlike in many other parts of ophthalmology where you are just uh, seeing, diagnosing, managing. So it was a wonderful session, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Patmamali, Dr. Soon Fekchi, Dr. Vinita Rao, Dr. Mamta Agarwal. Can you all come? Akash? Professor Soon is there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you very much. So please look into the camera yeah. and say cheese. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is uh, really an amazing program. About 500 people have watched it live. And oh. I'm sure that in the next week, because it was a working day, uh, I actually thank you because in the working day, it was a cramped session and uh, we could finish it and write in time. Thank you very much all. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Jamie. Thank you, Shunpet, for, for giving.